Hi again, everyone. Thank you very much for joining the afternoon session of our final conference. Uh, we'll be still waiting a couple more minutes uh, to let everyone uh, join the session, and we will get started uh, very soon. Well, hoping everyone hears me well. Uh, Hello everyone, again, thank you very much for joining our afternoon session on, uh, of our final conference on Global Solid Fuel Value Chain Research and Invest, which is a, a continuation of the session that's placed this morning. Um, a conference taking place in the context of a European Commission funded uh, study, Solid Fuels Research and Invest, defining and developing the global solid fuel value chain, techno-economic analysis and pathways for sustainable implementation. So we have a busy agenda today, which I will now present to you um, directly. So we will start um, this afternoon's session by a welcome address from Antonio de Rose from EY as project management uh, manager to the study. We'll then continue with a, a high level speech uh, given by Dennis Thomas from Hydrogenics. Um, this afternoon session will continue with a panel discussion um, to discuss the topic towards industrial generation of solid fuels uh, with our different panelists uh, that uh, provided speeches this morning and uh, in this afternoon session as well, and which will be moderated by my colleague Nicholas Merriman from EY. This will be followed by a short 15 minute Q&A uh, session um, and then continue with a, a 15 minute break. 
um, in the middle of the session. We will then um, get back to uh, our afternoon uh, discussion with a presentation of our project results on the economic roadmap and market outlook for sustainable solid fuels for 2050 and 2100, which will be presented by Nicholas Merriman and myself. And this will be followed by a Q&A uh, moderated by Nicholas, as well as short closing remarks by Nicholas as well. So just before we get on to our, our, the core of our discussion, I'd like to very quickly go through the meeting code of conduct with you. So just to say, please make sure to display your name, surname and organization. Um, the team will help you individually to, to do so. So please do send um, to the panelists your name, surname and organization so that we can display it correctly on, the, on, the, the, on Zoom. Um, secondly, I'd like to say that any questions uh, that should be raised to the panelists uh, should be done so via the Q&A function. Uh, of course, we'll try to uh, respond to all of the raised questions um, during the different Q&A sessions that will take place uh, this afternoon. Um, otherwise, some will also be uh, answered in written form. Uh, finally, for any questions concerning the, the functioning of Zoom, any technical uh, question, please do ask them via the chat function. Um, one short disclaimer uh, to say that this conference uh, will, is recorded. Uh, it will be live streamed on SEPS's YouTube channel uh, and will be made available for, for later view. Um, for any more information on, um, on the privacy policy or any questions, please do reach out to the info.solofuel um, EY email that you can see on the slide. Um, and for any uh, further information on our privacy policy, please do refer to the link that is provided. With no further ado, um, I'd like to give the floor to uh, Antonio de Rose to give um, the, the welcome address to this uh, afternoon session. Thank you, Pauline. I hope everyone hears me well. Um, so thank you all for joining this afternoon session. My name is Antonio de Rose. I lead the green development practice at EY and I'm the project manager for this study. So let me firstly say, I'm very excited to be here today with uh, uh, this, I mean, such an, an important panel of uh, international experts to discuss about this uh, visionary topic. And uh, looking behind what happened this morning, uh, we went through uh, the technological perspective. Uh, we looked at the solar fuels across all the, the, um, the technological pathways and trying to identify, discuss, and appreciate the bottlenecks and the, the uh, I mean, the maturity issues that we are incurring in at the moment. Um, looking beyond, I mean, what will be uh, the, the, the scope of this afternoon session is to go through um, the economic roadmap which is, of course, directly linked to the technological one, and also to, I mean, trying to, to give uh, a market outlook for uh, the, the solar fuels. And essentially, we will try to reply to two important questions. So the first one is uh, when uh, the solar fuels will, uh, will become cost competitive. And the second one is, what kind of share in the energy mix the solar fuels can aim at by 2050 and beyond. So all this uh, uh, have been occupied quite intensively, our project team uh, over the last year. And uh, my colleague and energy economist, uh, Nick Merriman, will, uh, will walk us through the, the, this, uh, I mean, our uh, findings and insights related to the economic roadmap and the market outlook, but only after having voiced the, uh, the industry perspective through our uh, guest, Dennis Thomas, which comes from uh, Hydrogenics, which is a multinational uh, um, developer of uh, hydrogen uh, production technologies, is headquartered in Canada, but have strong presence in Europe. And so I would like to thank Dennis to, to having accepted to be part of this uh, uh, panel discussion this afternoon. And uh, I would leave the floor to Dennis and would wish everyone really to enjoy 
uh, and hope to, to have uh, an interesting and very inspiring conversation over the afternoon. So it's the floor is yours, Dennis. Hello, uh, good afternoon. I think you can hear me well. Please confirm. I think it's yes, okay. Yes, we do. We do, Dennis. Yes. Thank you. Uh, thanks for uh, giving me the, the floor actually to make a, a presentation on the um, solar power to um, hydrogen to fuels, as I like, uh, as I like to call it. Uh, my name is Dennis Thomas. Uh, I'm in charge of the uh, global uh, business development for the um, um, electrolyzer business at, uh, at Cummins um, Hydrogenics. So um, before uh, introducing you to the technology of uh, electrolyzers and then to discuss the topic of uh, uh, solar fuels, uh, a couple of words about our company. Uh, so as you rightly mentioned, um, Cummins is a, is a global company um, with more than 100 years um, history, um, mainly in the field of uh, combustion engines. And the company started uh, with uh, diesel engines and, uh, and diesel gensets, so power generators. And obviously, uh, due to the um, uh, energy transition, Cummins has diversified uh, its activities in the field of um, electrification of mobility and also of uh, power generation, and has made a series of acquisitions uh, in the field of batteries uh, in 2018, and, uh, and, and a couple of um, acquisitions and uh, partnerships as well, uh, especially last year and this year, uh, in the field of hydrogen and fuel cells. Um, globally, um, we are present in more than 190 countries uh, with more than uh, 60,000 employees. Uh, we own our own um, our, our distributors uh, with more than 8,000 uh, locations around the globe. Um, concerning the hydrogen activities, uh, which is, I think, um, uh, most of the topic of, uh, of today, um, uh, Cummins is active on electrolysis, fuel cells, and also uh, with hydrogen storage tanks. Um, out of these uh, acquisitions that I've just mentioned, uh, we were, I was part of um, Hydrogenics, and Hydrogenics uh, was involved in alkaline and PEM electrolysis, uh, uh, leading in, in this field, uh, and also uh, leading in the field of uh, PEM fuel cells. Uh, and there were also a previous acquisition uh, about the solid oxide fuel cell activity of General Electric. And um, in June this year, uh, we announced a, a joint venture with uh, NPROX in Germany uh, concerning the hydrogen uh, storage tanks. You see um, below on the pictures, um, some of the projects uh, in which uh, we've been uh, involved in the past. So concerning uh, the electrolyzer business, uh, we can distinguish uh, two types of segments. Uh, one is the uh, industrial uh, generation of hydrogen. So meaning um, industries that need the hydrogen molecule. Uh, and sometimes uh, it is more convenient or even uh, cheaper for them to buy an electrolyzer than to buy the molecule to an industrial gas supplier. Um, I would say this has been our main market uh, for the last um, uh, 50 years. But obviously, uh, there is a lot of activity today on the, on the second uh, segment, which is what we call power to X. And it's mainly driven uh, by uh, decarbonization purposes. And I think that's really the, the topic of today. Just to be complete on the activities on the, on the company, on the fuel cell side, uh, we have a major focus on um, uh, fuel cell uh, for mobility and especially uh, for those applications uh, uh, which are part of the heavy duty. So using of um, use of fuel cells in trucks, trains, and, and buses. Uh, and, and maybe also to mention, uh, we still have a kind of a partnership with uh, Air Liquid uh, concerning the um, uh, all the hydrogenics uh, activities. I, I assume most of you have seen this kind of um, um, schematic um, over the last years. Um, I like to, to still present it uh, because it shows quite nicely uh, the different roles of um, hydrogen uh, in the energy transition. Uh, and it shows also that the driving force is decarbonization and especially the use of renewable energy, such as wind and solar. And I think the focus of today is uh, on solar um, to help also the integration of more renewable energy into the energy system. 
And obviously, in most of the cases, you wonder why what you would like to do with the hydrogen. And actually, here are the five main functions that we see for hydrogen. It can be used for power to power applications, combining, for instance, electrolyzers and fuel cells. Hydrogen can be ejected in the existing gas grids, uh, either directly or uh, via uh, methanation technologies to actually um, uh, synthesize uh, natural gas. It can also be used in the uh, existing uh, uh, industry. Uh, I will present a um, couple of minutes. Uh, where, where are the main applications for hydrogen in industry? And I think the topic of today is more about fuel uh, production from hydrogen. Uh, and the last one um, is one of the most elegant way to use hydrogen that's uh, for um, hydrogen mobility. So the use of hydrogen for fuel cell electric uh, vehicles. And obviously, this is quite complex uh, to um, put in place uh, because there are many challenges in terms of um, infrastructure, uh, both on the power side, on, on the gas side, uh, also on the uh, vehicle side. But you see also that uh, in the medium future, uh, we will see emerging some um, hydrogen grids directly, uh, which will um, help to um, capitalize on the synergies between all those activities. And also at the very end, you see also a gas power plant at the left part of this, uh, of this graph, um, because um, we, we believe that uh, uh, they will still play an important role in the energy transition, uh, and that hydrogen could be um, burned uh, either directly or together with, uh, with natural gas in gas power plants to actually uh, provide the backup power when there is less wind and less uh, sun uh, in combination also with our energy storage uh, technologies. Obviously on hydrogen today, there's a big, big, big momentum um, because um, major countries and regions are um, publishing policies uh, supporting um, hydrogen. And um, we have the impression that um, hydrogen is now seen as a kind of silver bullet uh, to tackle uh, the decarbonization uh, challenge in, in, in many applications, which are in fact uh, difficult to decarbonize. Uh, and this is especially the case um, for um, industry and for heavy duty transport. And among those initiatives, uh, I think uh, Europe is, is leading. Um, there's been uh, a, a lot of announcements uh, over the last weeks uh, with the publication of the um, European hydrogen strategy. Uh, in, in which there are some objectives to deploy um, two times 40 gigawatt of electrolysis by 2030 uh, with an intermediate uh, target at uh, six gigawatts by 2025. Uh, these are massive objectives, um, especially for Europe, considering that the, the global manufacturing capacity for electrolyzers today is in the range of 200 megawatts per year at the global uh, level. And we see also that in uh, some of the European scenarios, um, they, they think that there is a potential for more than uh, 500 gigawatts of electrolysis uh, only for Europe by 2050. Obviously, all this will require a very um, complex and a coordinated uh, approach to ensure the, the success, because as I've mentioned, it is also uh, dependent on the infrastructure in place. Uh, both on um, how to transport the hydrogen uh, when it is produced, whether it needs to be converted into um, uh, fuels, also about um, um, safety aspects, uh, market stimulation programs uh, to stimulate the production, but also the demand. Um, obviously, uh, a lot of discussions on the technology uh, maturity and the different technologies, for instance, on electrolysis, but it could be also on the um, application side. And then um, there is a, a major topic, which is about uh, industry leadership. And we see that the major uh, regions around the globe are competing to at attract uh, technologies uh, in their regions to get also the, the job and the, uh, and the value creation in, in those regions. And, and today, uh, I would say that the leading countries on this, uh, it's mainly Europe uh, with Germany, France, UK, Spain, Portugal, the Netherlands. But we see also a very strong activity in California and the US and also regions like China, Australia, Japan, Chile, and Korea. Um, a lot of people, especially when we touch the topic of um, solar fuels or um, e-fuels, they, they wonder um, 
what what is the best solution uh, for the different type of um, applications and um we have read a lot of uh, reports uh, over the last uh, two three years and uh, uh, particularly um, like the one which has been published under the report uh, mission possible uh, where they try to identify uh, what will be the role of direct electrification because this is always uh, the most efficient way actually to uh, decarbonize, but it's not always easy to use direct electrification because of the mismatch between the production and, and the use. Then you see uh, the second category, uh, which is for hydrogen, the direct use of hydrogen. And then you see uh, ammonia and, uh, and synth fuels. Um, and and, and then ammonia uh, in this report, um, they expect that uh, it could play a major role in, uh, in shipping. Uh, but also in energy storage and, and in the transportation of hydrogen over long distances. That could be the case about uh, producing um, hydrogen in the Idi Sahara or in the, in the south um, of, uh, of Argentina, for instance, where there is a lot of wind uh, or in Australia, uh, but there is no consumer for it. So there is a lot of uh, attention today on, on ammonia for those applications. Uh, and then there is also uh, syn fuels so mainly uh, carbon-based uh, fuels combined with hydrogen, especially for aviation and also for some uh, uh, industrial use, such as in, in plastics. And, and I would tend to agree with this uh, uh, long-term vision. We talk about hydrogen. Um, I think it's, it's important to get a, a feeling of uh, what is the current um, hydrogen market today and how is some um, hydrogen being uh, produced and as you can see on the left uh, side of this um, um, schematic, um, most of the hydrogen today around the globe is made out of natural gas using a process called uh, steam methane reforming. This is the most commonly um, used technique to make hydrogen because natural gas is extremely cheap. And so you can expect to generate hydrogen at a cost around one euro or one dollar per kilogram. The second um, way to um, uh, produce hydrogen, this is in uh, oil cracking. So typically in refineries that they would generate naturally hydrogen. And you will see that as it, there is a major use of hydrogen in refineries, this hydrogen is typically recycled inside the refinery. Then you have gasification technologies that could be uh, with coal or biomass. Uh, this is mainly used in Asia and in particular in, in China. And then you get two technologies um, which are um, using uh, electricity as the main input with water electrolysis uh, representing in less than 1%. And then also the production of chlorine, uh, which is using electrolysis technologies. But in that case, chlorine is the main product and hydrogen is the byproduct. So today, water electrolysis is very small uh, in the global uh, landscape, but it has uh, a lot of people and governments are betting on this technology to actually achieve a deep decarbonization also in industry. So today, who are the consumers for um, hydrogen? There are two big consumers. Uh, one is the fertilizer uh, industry. So uh, they make ammonia uh, to uh, produce then um, fertilizers. They consume 50% of the hydrogen production today. And then you get also refineries. Uh, but they recycle a significant part of their hydrogen and they use hydrogen for the desulfurization of the of the fuels. Um, and so uh, typically the hydrogen consumption is increasing. We are talking in this kind of uh, industrial complexes about a, a major uh, scale, because if we wanted to replace all the hydrogen consumption in a refinery uh, with hydrogen produced by an electrolyzer, we would need more or less in each refinery, an electrolyzer of 100, of 1,000 megawatts, sorry. So one gigawatt of electrolyzer in each refinery, that's the potential. So we see that the um, potential is huge, but also the challenge uh, is huge, um, especially in terms of infrastructure. Uh, and if we want to uh, use renewable energy to make that hydrogen. Then there are also um, some smaller users for hydrogen. Um, especially to create a protecting atmosphere and avoid uh, oxidation during the, the production process. So we see hydrogen consumption in flood glass, uh, in metallurgy, and in um, uh, manufacturing of semiconductors. And then some smaller use in power plants uh, for the cooling of the alternators 
in the food industry for the hydrogenation of oils. So for instance, to make margarine uh, and to convert oil to a solid state, you need hydrogen. And then finally, uh, for the mobility. And in between, between the consumers and the producers, there is already um, a big industry uh, dominated by the uh, uh, industrial uh, gas companies, uh, typically uh, Air Liquide, Linde, uh, Praxair, and Air Products, uh, transporting the hydrogen um, via pipelines from those production centers to the clients, sometimes owning directly a steam methane reformer on site of a refinery or a fertilizer plant. And for smaller users, um, they would typically transport the hydrogen via trucks and, and tube trailers. And if they are really small users, then they would use um, uh, bottles. And so um, we see a little bit different uh, reference prices also for hydrogen in those industries. So large industries, they pay close to the production uh, cost of uh, steam methane reformers. Uh, smaller clients, they would pay higher and because the volume they have is lower and also uh, because of uh, transport, uh, which is typically uh, involved and the price will vary according to the volumes and the um, uh, distance from the uh, production center. And you see also some reference prices for hydrogen in, in mobility. What I want to highlight for the case of um, hydrogen, and we will come back on this uh, later in the, in the presentation, is that there is a direct relationship uh, between the price of electricity um, which is uh, used uh, for the electrolyzer and the price of hydrogen. Because um, um, to manufacture or to produce one kilogram of hydrogen, you need uh, 50 uh, kilowatt hours. So if you pay 20 euros per megawatt hour, it will directly translate into one euro per kilogram of hydrogen. And so this is one of the major challenge actually. And that's also one of the question which has been highlighted in the uh, introduction. Um, when do we expect solar fuels to be cost competitive? I think power price is certainly uh, one of the main criteria. If we can get power prices in the range of 10 euros, for instance, uh, per megawatt hour, then we can think about actually having something which could become competitive uh, with uh, fossil um, hydrogen. Um, here is an overview of the um, uh, products uh, that we have at Cummins. Uh, concerning the um, uh, water electrolyzer products. Um, I will not make a deep dive in um, let's say all those products, but uh, we are uh, working with two technologies. Uh, one is alkaline technology and the other one is proton exchange membrane technology. Uh, alkaline is very old. Uh, that's a technology that uh, is uh, on the market uh, for more than, uh, than 30 years. So it is a very mature technology and we have products up to uh, 500 kilowatts, so alpha megawatt today, uh, containerized uh, systems, uh, turnkey products, uh, kind of plug and play. You just need uh, a connection to the water, a connection to the power uh, grid, and then it will deliver hydrogen and also uh, oxygen. Um, then on the uh, PEM um, uh, systems, uh, we go uh, more in the, in the bigger scale, uh, in the megawatt uh, scale. So we still have um, uh, one product, which is a, a, a turnkey system containerized up to 2.5 megawatts. And then we are entering into the large scale type of products, uh, five megawatts and more, uh, where those products are typically uh, indoor. Uh, so you need to, to have a building that will host all the equipment. Um, and we see also that those projects are much more complex, uh, especially on the utility part and the connection to the, to the client and to the application. And so uh, you would see typically uh, EPC companies uh, involved uh, combining the electrolyzer technology uh, with uh, potentially uh, a methanol production units or uh, an ammonia synthesis. Uh, and so uh, we, we would typically deliver only the electrolyzer blocks uh, for those uh, projects. Uh, interesting for uh, the um, uh, solar to um, hydrogen uh, type of project, is that there is a good um, a turn down ratio, uh, especially with the PEM uh, technology, is that we can use the technology between five and up to 125% of the nominal capacity. Uh, and we can also uh, fluctuate the operation of the electrolyzer um, uh, very quickly. So it is um, uh, quite interesting um, in combination with solar. Concerning uh, the, the PEM technology, uh, it's, it's less mature than the alkaline. 
uh, but uh, we have installed, uh, I would say, the technology in quite many reference uh, sites uh, today. And you see some of the examples here, uh, a power to gas product in Germany, uh, a power to power system combined with uh, a fuel cell in, uh, in Thailand, uh, one megawatt. We have been involved in the MEFCO project in Germany about uh, a methanol uh, production um, uh, from uh, renewable energy. Uh, high balance projects in uh, Denmark, uh, where the hydrogen is used both for mobility and industry. Uh, a 2.4 megawatt project in Germany, uh, combining uh, a power to gas and also the uh, use of um, hydrogen for a refilling station. And then um, a last one, which is um, a project in, in Canada, uh, which is a power to gas uh, project, um, where the hydrogen is injected into the, the gas grid. And in fact, on that project, I want to show um, the way uh, the electrolyzer is being operated in that project in, in Canada. Uh, and in fact, uh, the electrolyzer is uh, providing a, a secondary frequency control regulation uh, for the um, um, electrical TSO, uh, which is called ISO uh, in that part of, uh, of Canada. And, uh, and the electrolyzer is able to ramp up and ramp down uh, on the on the complete um, say window of operation, and we get the signal every two seconds uh, from the from the ISO. And uh, in fact, the system is operating uh, very nicely because you see that the two curves, the the, the signal curve and the response, uh, they match uh, nicely with each other. And uh, when we think about combining electrolyzers uh, with uh, with solar uh, PV, for instance, uh, it would operate uh, in a very uh, similar way where actually um, the power um, system would set, would, would send a, a power set point to the electrolyzer and we would match the uh, consumption of, uh, of energy, of, or of power uh, with what is delivered by the solar uh, PV uh, system. Um, that's not all. Uh, so as I've mentioned already in the table of products, we are uh, upscaling the, the technology. Uh, and um, on, on this slide, you see, in fact, uh, a 20 megawatt uh, project, uh, which we are uh, currently uh, building um, in Canada uh, together with uh, Air Liquide. Uh, Air Liquide will be the client of that uh, project. Um, and uh, it is made out of uh, four uh, units of five megawatts, which are using uh, two stacks of 2.5 megawatts. The stacks are really where the electrolysis reaction uh, is taking place. Uh, for such a plant, uh, we need a DC current. So as it is a, a grid connected system, uh, we need the rectifiers uh, converting the um, uh, AC to DC, which will feed directly the, the electrolyzers. And then you need also um, some utilities to make it work. So uh, you need to purify the water that we is going to be used uh, in the electrolysis um, uh, process. So there is a, a water treatment plant uh, using reverse osmosis. At the end of the plant, you can also uh, install a hydrogen purification system to remove any impurities that would be in the hydrogen. And in this case, it would be mainly uh, oxygen. And you need also some cooling equipment because all the losses uh, in the system are, are converted as heat. And usually uh, you would have uh, 25 to 30%, uh, which will be lost uh, in the form of, uh, of heat. Um, so that was, I would say, the, the introduction on, on, on payments and, and the products and also the role of hydrogen. Let's have a look at uh, the uh, economical aspects of power to hydrogen and then um, um, hydrogen to, to fuels. So if you look at the generation cost of hydrogen uh, from the um, from an electrolyzer, uh, you will see that uh, there is a more or less a 20% uh, which is linked to the initial investment uh, in the electrolyzer. Uh, there is some um, OPEX, um, let's say, uh, including all the uh, preventive and corrective uh, maintenance that uh, you need to foresee on those uh, equipment. But the bulk of the, of the cost of hydrogen is made out of electricity. And depending on where you are, um, if you are grid connected or not, then you will have like um, uh, different uh, elements uh, for the price of electricity. Uh, also uh, good to mention that the capex will be directly um, proportional to the number of operating hours. Um, and if you can operate your electrolyzer full time, obviously you will minimize the capex. But if you are using only solar energy, 
then it means that you would only use electrolyzer for something like one to 2,000 hours per year. So it means that the capex uh, will be more important in the cost of hydrogen. On the revenue uh, side um, of this uh, type of business case, um, you have the possibility to have a, a feedstock income. So you can sell the hydrogen, hydrogen uh, which has the highest value of all the products. Sometimes also you can uh, valorize the oxygen, uh, but it's in most of the cases difficult to find an oxygen client uh, close to a hydrogen um, a production plant. It's only the case uh, in uh, industrial areas, for instance. Um, concerning the heat valorization, uh, it's not easy uh, to valorize the heat in alkaline and PEM technologies uh, because we only generate low temperature heat. Um, and so uh, it's generally difficult. If you have a grid connected system, uh, you can generate some additional income uh, from um, the provision of balancing services, which is what I presented before uh, with the project in Canada. And today uh, we still uh, require some of the technology push and market pull measures uh, to make those projects uh, profitable. And I think that's uh, in this respect that the, the, the hydrogen strategy at European level is really uh, making a difference uh, in getting those projects uh, out of the ground to um, upscale the, uh, the, the industry and the manufacturing capacity in Europe and also uh, on the medium term to reduce the, the cost of the technology. Um, if you want to have a good business case uh, with those technologies, uh, you need the combination of those three elements. Uh, you need a low power price, um, you need a high operating time, and then obviously try to target uh, a, a market uh, which is offering a high value for your uh, products. Um, if you look at the cost of um, hydrogen, there are a number of uh, reports uh, available. Um, I think uh, a good one is the one from the uh, International um, um, uh, Association of um, Energy. Um, and here you see the main factors. So the, the impact of the CapEx, and you see that the CapEx has a limited impact on the cost of hydrogen. You see that the electricity price has a much more impact actually on the cost of hydrogen. You see also the impact of the full load hours. Uh, and especially for the case of solar, uh, you would be operating uh, in, this, um, in this part where you see the, the dotted line. And so um, we need to find ways actually to uh, increase the uh, operating time. So I will um, uh, conclude with a, a couple of, um, I'd say, um, recommendations um, for those who would be um, uh, developing uh, projects uh, for solar um, to, to fuels. I would say um, we see a lot of projects uh, which are focusing first on the renewable energy. And, and our advice would be uh, focus on the client uh, because you might find uh, many locations where you may, can make uh, renewable hydrogen or even uh, solar fuels. Uh, but uh, they will never materialize if you don't have a client for them. And so best start with the client, uh, make sure that you know um, what would be the price to beat, uh, check if there is um, a, a, a renewable or a green value that you can add, uh, and then you can start to actually build your uh, uh, business plan. There is also some considerations concerning a direct connection or grid connected uh, systems uh, to, be, to be considered. Uh, key success factor number two, uh, focus on regions uh, with a high solar irradiation and high capacity factor. Uh, I think it is obvious to minimize the cost of electricity and maximize the operating time. That's even um, more true uh, if you combine uh, solar and wind, uh, because then you can really maximize the operating time. Uh, and you see here a map uh, which has been published uh, last year um, concerning uh, the expected a production cost of um, hydrogen uh, in um, around the globe. Uh, key success factor number two, I would say go beyond your comfort zone uh, and go at scale. So what we see is that a lot of projects actually being, um, let's say, uh, elaborated from, um, let's say, one partner. Uh, but in fact, the more you uh, include the complete project, uh, the better uh, it becomes and, and the better actually you can provide a secured um, a price for your fuel on the long term, uh, which will have actually a value for the uh, for the end user. And typically, you would need to integrate different technology blocks, uh, the renewables, a uh, electrolyzer, some kind of synthesis could be methanol, ammonia, uh, and then also some logistics uh, conditioning and transport of the molecule that you are going to generate. 
You can also even go further and include the downstream processes, um, including the, the, the vehicle offering, for instance, or even the, the, the selling uh, renewable gases. And obviously, um, going at scale uh, will reduce the cost of the project um, and will also uh, help to uh, reduce the, 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 the production cost of those, uh, of those fields. Uh, we get a lot of questions about um, the, the units and how to make calculations with hydrogen. I provide here for your reference um, a slide with the, the basic maths uh, for hydrogen, converting kilograms to cubic meters to uh, megawatt hours, etc. Um, if you are focusing on, on, on um, solar to hydrogen uh, systems, uh, just con you can consider that a one megawatt peak uh, solar PV system uh, that would generate um, more or less 800 to 1,500 megawatt hours per year would in fact generate um, between 16 and 30 tons of hydrogen uh, per year. And last uh, slide, um, conclusions. So what I have tried to uh, illustrate today what the, was that actually hydrogen technologies they are ready today, they are mature, but there is still an important um, uh, potential for cost reduction, especially by uh, increasing the scale of the projects and um, also on the, on the manufacturing side. Can be used in, uh, in many uh, sectors uh, to decarbonize them. Um, as I've mentioned, uh, there is a, a big momentum at the political level and hydrogen is perceived as a kind of silver bullet. And there are major initiatives uh, and major funding, uh, which is also um, available. Um, Cummins um, has all the technologies which are needed uh, in this respect, and is also partnering with uh, key players around the globe to offer uh, turnkey uh, systems. And on our side, we are in fact uh, getting prepared for this uh, gigawatt era of hydrogen technologies, and uh, we can be sure that uh, we will see a, a lot of hydrogen uh, in the next uh, decades. Um, and uh, I would like to, to thank you very much uh, for your attention during this um, presentation. You can see uh, my contact details there. Uh, the slides will be made available uh, for the participants uh, to, the, to the conference. And I have also included in the appendix um, a list of all the um, studies that, that we have seen and that might uh, answer some of your questions on the business case of uh, power to hydrogen and uh, power to fuel. Uh, I want thank you for your attention. Well, Denis, many, many thanks for this uh, very interesting presentation. Um, you know, I think uh, that it'll stir a lot of uh, good discussion that hopefully we can cover during the, Q the, the panel um, that we'll be having just now. I uh, also see that uh, the Q&A, uh, in the Q&A, um, a couple of questions already, have already popped up. And, uh, you know, if, if we have time, I'd, I'd definitely like to be able to address those uh, during the panel discussion. Uh, and, and then also, I just want to say, uh, you know, I think it provides a great introduction to um, the, the results, the presentation of results on the market outlook and economic roadmap um, that we'll be uh, that we'll be doing going forward, uh, you know, after the break later this afternoon. So again, uh, uh, thank you very much. Um, yeah, the next part of our presentation of our of our day today um, will be a, a panel discussion with um, uh, well yourself, Denise. So uh, thank you for staying on. Uh, we also have uh, Philippe Schild from the European Commission, uh, so, uh, Professor Sophia Hausner from um, the EPFL. And uh, and uh, Deepak Pant. So I would invite all panelists, um, you know, essentially to um, uh, yeah to get ready. And um, I, I think that uh, you know going forward, um, uh, the ideal situation is if if you could possibly uh, stay muted uh, while you, while you're not speaking, um, just to avoid any background noises. That would be great. Uh, however, of course, you know, for a smooth flow of conversation, you know, uh, uh, happy of course to you know. Uh, let a bilateral exchange uh, uh, go forward. So, so absolutely no worries there. Um, and just uh, maybe to kick off our panel, um, I was thinking, um, you know, I have a question for, um, uh, perhaps, you know, just uh, actually briefly before kicking it off, uh, just I wanted to invite uh, all of you to uh, give a, sh a couple short words on yourself, just for the benefit of people uh, who might not have been there this morning, uh, just briefly present yourself. and. And I might just start uh, here in order um, with uh, Philippe. Philippe, um, are you are you with us? And and could you give us a, a few a few words? Uh, thank you, Nicola. Yes, I'm with us. I hope that you do hear me. Um, so I'm Philippe Schild. I work at the European Commission and the Director General on Research and Innovation. Uh, I'm a senior expert in the unit on clean energy transition. Uh, in fact, I've been working in renewable energy for the past twenty years 
from the Commission side, uh, uh, following projects and uh, uh, developing strategies for renewable energy. Fantastic. Thanks, Philippe. Now, Sophia? Yeah, so I'm Sophia Hauser. I'm an associate professor at EPFN in Lausanne, Switzerland. That's a technical university. I'm in the mechanical engineering department, and we are working on uh, designing and scaling solar energy conversion devices. Great, thank you. Um, you know, I think that everybody's heard from Denis, but you know, uh, go ahead if you'd like to uh, present yourself again briefly. Yes, no, actually, I realized I forgot to mention something. Um, but uh, in fact, I started my career in the field of uh, solar photovoltaics. Uh, I've or, I worked uh, eight years in this field uh, in various uh, functions in, in Belgium and also at the uh, European level, uh, especially working for uh, Solar for Europe. And actually, I, I've made the big uh, jump to hydrogen uh, six years ago and uh, working uh, only for um, hydrogenics and no chemins uh, on the business development and um, I would say regulatory aspects of um, hydrogen. And mainly at, at European level. Thank you, Denis and Deepak. Hello, good afternoon. Uh, Deepak Pant from uh, the Flemish Institute for Technological Research, VITO. I'm a senior scientist there. I started uh, my career here after a PhD uh, almost 13 years ago and uh, on biosystems, bioelectrochemical systems, initially microbial fuel cells for energy recovery and then microbial electrosynthesis. For the last couple of years, we are now focusing more on electrocatalytic conversions uh, for CO2 conversion as well as organic electrosynthesis. Well, great. Thank you for all those introductions. Uh, we definitely do appreciate it. And we appreciate you taking the time to join our panel today. We look forward to um, hearing your viewpoints on uh, some of the stuff that we've discussed today, and especially really focusing on uh, you know, the roadmap towards industrial generation of solar fuels. Uh, so just my first question really is uh, addressed to Philippe here. And I was wondering, um, you know, I, I uh, just saw today in the news that the, the Danish government has announced uh, plans to, uh, essentially it's climate plan, uh, plans to reduce uh, their, their uh, carbon emissions relative to 1990 levels uh, by 70% to 2030. So that's quite an ambitious climate plan. And, uh, you know, I noticed that, that Power to X actually uh, uh, is a really a key component of, of this plan. And, uh, you know, obviously, I think we're all uh, quite aware that, uh, you know, uh, uh, Denmark is maybe not blessed with the same uh, level of, uh, you know, solar irradiation as, uh, say, North Africa. Um, and, and, you know, they're more kind of a leader in wind power. So I was just wondering if you could uh, maybe briefly comment on what role you see wind power playing uh, in of, uh, you know, essentially of, uh, of power to X and, uh, and generally of, uh, of synthetic fuels. Uh, uh, yes, Nicola. Uh, just for your information, I did switch off my camera because I'm getting a bit of a bandwidth problem. Uh, <laughs> you are starting to sound like a computer. <laughs> so. Um, yeah, I think your uh, your point is sort of uh, your question is is quite interesting. I think it's uh, I will in a sense uh, answering in two ways. Um, first, um, when uh, you are using electricity to decarbonize an industry, uh, you have to make sure that your electricity is decarbonized. I think this is sort of one aspect that uh, we tend to forget when we discuss about electrification and using electricity to replace uh, an, as an energy source is that sort of the, quite often the electricity is not. In fact, if I take uh, the, uh, uh, the statistics from 2018, only about 32% of the electricity produced in Europe were from renewables. And from that, a third was from hydropower, a third was from wind, uh, and almost, uh, sorry, I hate, uh, only sort of 10% was from solar. So in a sense, by stating these statistics, uh, you, it's clear that wind will play a major factor. But not only wind, I think this is also something we need to, uh, to keep in mind is there is a lot of renewable energy source available. And those sources, in fact, are very uh, geographically and locally dependent. Uh, you know, uh, you will have, for example, Austria, if I take this country, maybe relying much more on, uh, uh, on hydropower because they have a lot of resources. Uh, if I take Italy, maybe the north of Italy will rely a bit more on geothermal electricity. So uh, so it's not only wind and solar. 
I think this is something in the current debate we tend to forget is there is only not only one source. I think both wind and solar are very dominant uh, and have a big factor. So I think this sort of this is why we we hear them. Uh, the other things on the solar, I will not dismiss it completely, uh, even for for Europe as a solution, uh, because there is two aspects of the solar energy to consider: is uh, direct radiation or indirect radiation. Uh, and in a sense, you see that if uh, your system that you're building using solar energy is using direct solar radiation because you get a higher efficiency on it, obviously you will need to go to where most of the sun is without uh, um, much cloud cover. However, if your system is so flexible that uh, it can use diffuse radiation, uh, maybe with a smaller or less efficient uh, system, but you can spread it much more, may have also a bigger, a big impact. So I think it's a balance between sort of the efficiencies, the diffuse and how much energy you can collect. Uh, so um, uh, so this would be sort of uh, briefly uh, my take on, on the energy source. Thanks, no, that's great. And I think actually, you know, I think that actually uh, possibly opens up opportunities for discussion. And, you know, I was maybe thinking if um, I could ask Sophia to comment on this, given, you know, your practical experience. I know you have, uh, uh, you know, your own module running on campus, uh, you know, in Switzerland. Um, you know, you might get a lot of uh, sun in, in the summer, but, uh, you know, uh, you showed us that there were some variations from one day to the next on some year days, et cetera. So, you know, uh, if you could maybe, do you have, uh, uh, you know, any comments on what Philippe has just, uh, has just uh, said? Yeah, definitely a great question. Um, and surprisingly, let's say in the winter, we have relatively nice sunny direct solar irradiation days sometimes here. So this was a, a surprise uh, to us and, and, and interesting, let's say because we want to operate the system all year round, even in winter, uh, where it might be quite cold, um, but you still might have good irradiation. But obviously, if we would uh, go for a fuel production, fuel processing, we would move to the, mo to the, to the southern, uh, whatever, southern Spain, uh, if we want to stick to Europe, where we have good DNI conditions to get a lot out of it. I think I, I would like to connect to something that Philip said, which our simple techno-economic study also showed, you can have kind of two optimum. You can either have a highly engineered system, in our case with rather expensive uh, primary materials, and for this you want the best solar conditions you can have, or you can go to the system which is uh, cheaper, is, is, is sort of lower performing, maybe more abundant materials, but they're they're always producing a little bit and it's not really the efficiency that counts there, but more that they are uh, rather cheap. And those you could then uh, imagine to put e everywhere where you have uh, some sun available. So this is a bit how I maybe see it. Uh, um, definitely if you, if you want to maximize your production rates, you might not want to do this in Switzerland, but uh, first of all, to do research is, is good enough. Um, and and uh, maybe someone else also can take care of cost optimization and uh, and this might be a part of that rather than anything else. Great, yeah. Thank you for your answer, Sophia. I think that actually, uh, you know, what uh, really cues in my my next question that I planned for Denis here is, um, you know, I you know Denis, you, you briefly we had a slide uh, that that just briefly showed uh, you know the potential cost uh, for hydrogen. Under optimal conditions, you know, combining uh, both wind and, and solar, uh, you know, it's a very nice map showing, uh, you know, essentially what what could be the ideal sites, uh, uh, you know, worldwide, uh, ideal regions for, uh, you know, installing solar, uh, sorry, solar fuels. And um, and Sophia, you know, you mentioned, uh, you know, southern Spain. Obviously, I think North Africa uh, uh, popped up there. Um, you know, and, and this really brings a question that you know has been touched on, but. Uh, I'd like to go a little bit deeper on this is just um, uh, perhaps how do you foresee, you know, the development of the infrastructure required to really move um, the, the hydrogen uh, at, a, at a very large scale here, we're talking about a very large scale, uh, you know, from, you know, producing countries to, um, to, to you know, uh, importing countries. And I'm, and I'm thinking, I just want to touch on, on something as well that, uh, you know, I know that there are examples of, uh, of these developing supply chains worldwide, uh, you know, and I know that Australia is exporting uh, uh, hydrogen to Japan, for example, and I know that's 
you know, based on coal gasification. Uh, we're not talking about solar hydrogen yet, but you know, I, I know that there are pilot projects, but I, I was just interested in hearing your take on um, you know, essentially how might that develop uh, for us to see uh, hydrogen contributing substantially to our energy needs in 2050. Thank you for that question. That's a very uh, interesting one. Um, the first comment um, I, I would make is that, uh, especially as you rightly pointed out, um, we see some regions um, realizing that they are sitting on a huge capital of renewable energy potential. And uh, taking the example of Australia, um, they have a big country, uh, not a lot of population, not so important uh, energy consumption in respect to the size of the country. And so they, they, they look at hydrogen as a way to export their renewable energy into other regions of the world. And, and we see a couple of countries with more or less the, the, the same concept. Uh, we see Chile, um, we see uh, Morocco, uh, and, and we also start to see uh, all the Middle East countries uh, looking at the, this possibility as well to, to replace gradually, um, let's say, fossil fuels by, by solar fuels. Um, obviously, um, there is, um, let's say, a lot going on, uh, and you probably see a lot of press releases of major companies uh, investing in that field. There was an announcement uh, a couple of weeks ago about a major project, a five gigawatt project uh, with, uh, with uh, NAM and, and Air Products, if I'm not mistaken, about uh, green ammonia in the Middle East. And I expect that we will see much more of these uh, in, in the coming years. Now, coming back on the, uh, on the infrastructure question, uh, it will be uh, indeed quite complex. Uh, and it will depend on the uh, distance to, to transport the, the molecule, um, whether you need to cross uh, seas or not. And, and obviously, uh, the preferred scenario um, in Europe uh, will be a kind of um, a pipeline structure uh, to actually uh, transport the hydrogen from one region to another. And there's been a, a publication, uh, I think, um, beginning of September or end of August, um, about um, most of the gas TSOs in Europe um, uh, publishing, um, I'd say, a map of Europe and where they would see the first um, hydrogen pipelines and actually converting some of the uh, gas infrastructure to hydrogen. And we could see also uh, hubs, hydrogen hubs, uh, mainly located uh, in, um, in, in, in ports and harbors, um, where you would actually have imports of hydrogen in whatever form. It could be liquid hydrogen, it could be ammonia, it could be uh, a kind of, if you like, uh, like methanol, and, and where it would be actually reconverted to hydrogen and then injected into the, the pipeline. Uh, it means that on the, on the other side, uh, in those countries that I've just mentioned, like, uh, like Chile and Australia, uh, they need to make the, the production at very large scale. Um, the interest is that the, the solar irradiation uh, is wonderful in those locations. Uh, you don't bother anybody because you're in the middle of nowhere. So there is no NIMBY effect uh, in those locations. Uh, and then you need to invest into, um, let's say, exporting um, infrastructure. And so typically you would need um, a maritime uh, transport and ship transport of those molecules. Um, concerning uh, uh, liquid hydrogen, uh, is it, it, there are some pilot projects, and you mentioned the project in Australia uh, of, uh, of Kawasaki, uh, but there are a lot of technical challenges uh, also, uh, because if you want to transport liquid hydrogen, uh, you need to maintain a temperature on board uh, in the range of minus uh, 253 degrees Celsius. So it is very challenging. Uh, it is possible, but it is challenging. Um, we see really a lot of activity on ammonia today uh, because there are already uh, there is already a, a big market for ammonia, uh, which is international. And there are, I would say, ships already um, 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 moving ammonia around the globe uh, at a significant scale. Uh, and so this value chain is already existing, uh, but there are some, um, let's say, concerns regarding the, let's say, um, the, 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 the poisonous, uh, the toxic um, aspect of ammonia. And so you can expect that there will be a lot of environmentalists uh, going against ammonia as a kind of new currency. But uh, I would say on the long term, I, I believe that ammonia is really well placed together with, uh, with liquid hydrogen, because those carriers, they don't carry any CO2. Uh, if you go to methanol, uh, it means that uh, if you're producing methanol in the middle of nowhere, you would need to extract it from the atmosphere. 
but then you would also release it in the point of use. And I think this is one of the major uh, disadvantage of, uh, of those type of uh, fuels. So ammonia and liquid hydrogen, uh, in my views, are the most uh, a promising one. And it will be a transport by ships and then reconditioning into hydrogen uh, close to the, the point of consumption. Yeah, well, that's that's great, and many thanks. Uh, you know, uh, it's definitely very enlightening to us as well. I mean, ammonia, to be honest, is is definitely um, something that uh, you know was w one of the fuels that might we we did not select in our in our uh, exercise here. You know, simply there's I think uh, too many pathways, too many different fuels to consider. But uh, you know, I think that that uh, really uh, you know you're bringing up some very interesting points here, and I was just wondering if maybe um, Deepak, uh, you know, I know that you focused a lot on. Um, uh, the downstream processing in in your uh, in your presentation, and if you, you might want to comment on what Denis said, and if there's any opportunities, I you know I, you know here I'm 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 really kind of just um, uh, or you know consider me a no, but not uh, like a, a little bit uh, you know I, I I'm 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 learning about all these technologies. Uh, you know I'm, I'm I'm an economist by trade, and uh, and so of course uh, you know I'm 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 you know, basically just uh, hypothesizing here, but is there any way to consider, uh, you know, building uh, infrastructure in Chile, for example, uh, to, to uh, further uh, process and, uh, and refine, uh, you know, the hydrogen and, and potentially the ammonia and, uh, and then turn that into uh, other alternative fuels that might be less of an issue for environmentalists or, or, or something like that. I was uh, wondering if you could give us your take on this. So here, I uh, thanks uh, for the question. And then I agree with uh, Denise, uh, who mentioned about Middle East, I think, uh, right? That uh, they are looking for alternatives and, and given the abundance of sun there. So we recently uh, started a project. It's a five-year cluster project uh, comprising of five different aspects of CO2 conversion, including uh, capture, uh, storage, conversion, downstream processing, and the overall techno-economic analysis. It's a, it's a five-year project. And uh, for the first time, they actually opened up uh, for technologies out Outside uh, Qatar, it's funded by Qatar Foundation. It will start as soon as the COVID thing is gone. Uh, so, so yes, that that's that's indeed uh, the the um, the way forward. The same I have experience uh, from Indian side. I am from India, but and I'm working in Belgium, so I do have a lot of collaborations there. And we often get uh, requests from traditional oil companies who who wants to uh, venture into alternatives and. It's all because of uh, the reducing uh, cost of electricity and uh, abundance of uh, uh, low uh, carbon feed stock, so to speak. Yes. Thank you, Deepak, for those comments. Um, I have a bit of, a, of another question here, just to kind of uh, shift focus again. Um, a, a question for Sophia. And uh, you know, I was very intrigued uh, to hear about the, the experiment you're, you have on campus. And I was just wondering, you know, I have a couple questions actually. And let me start with uh, just quickly on the first one is, uh, you know, I, I think you're producing, what is it, half a kilo of, uh, of hydrogen a day. Um, you know, can you comment as to what you're using that for currently? Yeah, so uh, yes, correct. It's ha about half a kilogram a day if we have a nice day and we can operate seven hours or so. Um, currently this hydrogen is fed into a microgrid which we have on campus, which is, um, another, let's say, research facility, different uh, professor who is, uh, is working on how different energy um, vectors, in a way, are actually working together, satisfying uh, the needs of a, a small uh, town, let's say. So you need electricity, you need uh, uh, heat, and, and he also wants hydrogen for fuel cells, which he has in there. And so we're basically providing this into this microgrid. Um, this is just, let's say, a scenario which was interesting here on campus um, with the startup company. We have a little bit other uh, other ideas where we would first go with the hydrogen. So we would target more the industry market and uh, use hydrogen as a, a chemical commodity uh, that we will provide on site uh, for the manufacturing, maybe in fertilizer production or something like this. Oh, that's great. I, I definitely, uh, that's, that's very nice to hear that it's being used, put to good use. So that's, uh, that's, that, that is very interesting. And so just um, now for my, my second question, uh, I was just wondering if you could comment quickly on, you know, um, just without wanting to spoil the results of the uh, economic analysis that we are going to be presenting uh, uh, shortly here, uh, you know, essentially just one of the key assumptions that we had for just the, the photoelectrochemical cell is that we would start seeing, um, you know, commercial production, or you know, just production at a commercial scale, uh, maybe around 2050, uh, but not really sooner. 
So, you know, that's, that's obviously that's, that's uh, in, in a relatively long time. And I was just wondering, um, you know, one thing we haven't considered necessarily is the uh, concentrated solar power. Um, so your technology, uh, you know, more specifically, and I was wondering if you could comment on this and maybe say, you know, do you have a different opinion? Uh, could it potentially come to market, uh, you know, any time earlier? Yeah, um, I would say it's a difficult question. Huh? It's always very tricky to predict into the future, particularly if uh, things are kind of out of your hand also, or our hand. So even with the system we have right now, where we feel quite comfortable with the performance, which we're seeing, um, we're not sure if this will actually be, be uh, going into the market and actually widespread uh, can penetrate into into any place where hydrogen is used, because there is much more uh, uh, at stake here uh, the, to make it actually work. And um, you need to also have a, a good collaborators use cases and so forth to, to make it happen. So I would say it's, it's difficult to say whether we are already there that we can claim um, we will be here for a while and survive and therefore we already there. Um, so now if we think about a, a time scale of 2050, um, I think that we could maybe say if uh, if uh, if we're very much dependent on uh, finding a material for photoelectrochemical system that uh, survives well in highly acidic or highly base condition while also performing well, um, uh, then the, the material discovery and so forth that will uh, take us some time and that could potentially take thirty years. And so if you if you really think about uh, completely new combination of materials and so forth, that might be a reasonable time horizon. We have taken a bit more a pragmatic point uh, or approach to it. This is why we, we believe we have already something that is ready. And frankly, I don't think we have time to, to wait around for, for 30 years. Um, so uh, hopefully that is a conservative um, prediction. And, and, and I would hope that maybe in, even in 10 years, there could be already something uh, that, that is there to stay. Well, thank you very much for that hopeful message. Uh, you know, I, I think we all share it here and uh, we're definitely hoping that, uh, you know, that, that could come true. Now, I, I want to come back to something that you said uh, earlier and that kind of struck me here is uh, you said something about uh, some things being out of your hands and that, you know, kind of brought back, uh, you know, I think just a couple of weeks ago, um, uh, as you might be aware, Airbus, um, you know, Airbus revealed a few, um, you know, Technology demonstrators, really some, uh, I think, prototypes, uh, I think they call them concept airplanes uh, in the same way that you would have a concept car. Uh, uh, so, so three concept airplanes that would be, uh, you know, run on hydrogen. And I was wondering if, um, you know, it's one thing that they said, I think, in their presentation was, uh, you know, that a lot of things here, as, is essentially echoing your words, where a lot of things were out of their hands, you know, essentially, uh, you know, the, the, the production of hydrogen, the whole infrastructure that would have to be brought into airports, et cetera. So I was wondering if maybe I could ask uh, here Philippe to um, comment on, on, you know, is there anything that the European Commission uh, is considering doing to uh, help, uh, you know, the entire, uh, you know, I, I guess hydrogen value chain from producers to, um, to consumers. And I know, uh, apology, I think Philippe uh, unfortunately has a, a meeting and, 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 I'm, and I hope that he's still able to kind of answer this question, but um, yes, uh, you know, can you, Briefly comment on this. Uh, yes, I can. I'm still, uh, <laughs> I'm still there. Uh, well, I think it's. Uh, I think a lot of uh, speakers already refer to it. At the moment, there is a, uh, a lot of activities on hydrogen at your level. Um, so, um, so in terms both on research and in trying to uh, uh, put together a lot of investment uh, to reach it. Uh, and also an application. I think it's uh, for the transport issue, as you took the example of uh, of Airbus uh, looking for hydrogen. I think it's uh, my colleagues dealing with sort of um, uh, aviation are uh, obviously having uh, projects uh, dealing with that. I think it's also uh, on the H2020, we had the, uh, the um, joint undertaking on the clean sky. Uh, and uh, Obviously, this undertaking is under discussion on the Horizon Europe uh, to continue to be continued or, or not to be continued. But uh, uh, there is a big expectation that this partnership will continue. So I think all activities related to um, 
the energy transition and to have a clean energy system uh, will intensify in the coming years. Uh, and we are looking at both aspects, you know, something which is more closer to what I'm doing more on, on the research and development, but also looking at uh, breaching those famous uh, valley of death. Uh, and I think there is more than one, uh, and we have to, and we are trying to be careful that uh, none of the technology developers are falling into one. So I think it's uh, uh, it's important uh, because, as uh, Sofia uh, mentioned, and uh, in a sense, Deepak also, it's uh, funding those research is not that an easy uh, an easy task. Uh, you know, it's uh, if you go to the current. If I'm being bold, I will say easy routes of uh, just building electrolyzer, then okay, it's easy. Uh, but if you try to do what Sofia and Deepak is doing, it's a bit more complicated um, because you are really trying to use directly the solar radiation or the source uh, to do it. Uh, so you need more development and it takes time and it takes resources. And I can't, I, I, sorry, I can only see, say at the moment that sort of uh, uh, we are very keen of having a successful technology being developed. Uh, so we are looking at uh, all the options available. Fantastic. Thanks, Philippe, for that, that answer. I think, uh, you know, uh, Denis, do you, do, you, do you have something you might want to add to this? I see your hand is raised. Yes, yes, I would like to add some, uh, some comments on this. Uh, actually, there are already um, hydrogen planes. Huh? Uh, there's been a couple of prototypes uh, being done with, by DLR in Germany uh, using hydrogen and fuel cells. Uh, we have been involved in those projects. Um, also, don't forget that uh, space uh, ships are launched with hydrogen, uh, liquid hydrogen. So there is a major expertise uh, there as well. So it's not crazy to think about using liquid hydrogen for aviation. The main challenge is the safety challenge and certification of those technologies to actually transport uh, passengers uh, and especially in airplanes with extreme conditions. So I would say this is uh, one of the main um, challenge. Uh, if the, the, the attendants, the, they, they want to have more information on, on, on those aspects, um, the FCHJU, uh, uh, so the Fuel Cell and Hydrogen Joint Undertaking, they have published uh, a detailed study uh, in June on that topic. And, and, and they make recommendations about uh, what can we expect uh, in the next decade and, 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 and after uh, concerning the role of um, hydrogen. Uh, but we cannot really expect a commercial flights on the hydrogen for at least 15 to 20 years. So um, I, I would agree again on, on the mission possible uh, conclusions that I've presented in my presentation that maybe there uh, e-fuels really have a role to play to actually start to decarbonize aviation today um, using, uh, I'd say, um, CO2 from a biomass of or direct air capture, um, and, and then make a synthetic uh, kerosene, for instance. And, and for me, that's one of the um, most um, in interesting way on, on the short term. Yeah, I think that's definitely, uh, you know, one of the key things that Airbus presented was, uh, you know, I think that they, in their strategy, they're talking about hydrogen planes, but indeed also uh, synthetic kerosene from, from, you know, solar fuels. And I think that that's a Definitely a, a, a key component uh, that we'll be exploring in our um, in our market outlook later on. Um, I think I, I, I still have one more question that I did want to ask Deepak. Um, that uh, essentially, just before going to some more questions from the audience, and just looking at the time here, uh, I want to make sure that we're able to address um, some of the questions that we've been getting in the Q and A. And I, and I want to invite again attendees to please, you know, if you have any additional questions, uh, to to use the, the the box there in the Q and A. So. Um, just, just this question I had was, uh, uh, I want to bridge a little bit between some of the, the results that we've seen uh, from, um, from Andrea this, uh, this morning on the biochemical pathways that we've studied under this, uh, this project. And then uh, you're, you're, you talked a lot about, uh, you know, bio, bio, electrochemical, I, I suppose, if you will, um, uh, you know, refining of, of uh, essentially, uh, you know, some pathways for, for producing fuels. And I, and I was just wondering if, um, you know, in my mind, what I see is that there might be, uh, you know, a, a bit of a trade-off between, um, you know, perhaps focusing on the high value compounds that you can um, that you can uh, extract from from these pathways, 
and 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 the, the the fuels essentially you might be optimizing your system to extract uh, you know more high value compounds or you might be optimizing more for fuels and if if you're trying to do both at the same time are you uh, really kind of helping develop the 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 the, the future uh, ways of producing fuels or or is this going to be a little bit still stay a bit of a of a of a side uh, project a bit of a, a byproduct of um, of another industry so yeah that's I suppose I. That, that's my question to you. Is that, is that question relatively clear? Uh, yes. So basically what you are asking is uh, how feasible is electrical to biofuel conversion going to be using bacteria in simple terms, right? I suppose. And especially how feasible is it to focus, uh, you know, given, get, well, given our, my understanding that, um, you know, when, when we look, especially at microalgae, I'm not less familiar with the technologies that you brought mm -hmm. up, but looking at microalgae, I think, uh, you know, some of the results we've seen is that it's very difficult to make that economically viable uh, mm -hmm. unless you're uh, taking into account uh, some of the high value compounds that you right. can extract along no, no, with yes. fuels, right? Yeah, and yeah. Uh, I, I suppose you might be familiar with the use cases. And, mm -hmm. and I was just wondering, you know, um, if you could comment on, on this idea that, you know, perhaps, uh, you know, the idea of extracting biofuels from these, from microalgae and from similar processes, uh, is, is, is it a realistic idea or should we really just be focusing on the on on uh, on the, the the high value compounds and 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 the fuels from there might not be uh, all that realistic. Yeah, it's a let's say it's a politically loaded question. So I will I will ref, uh, refrain from giving a, a direct answer. But yes, uh, from what I read from literature, the economic value is indeed going towards uh, high value nutraceuticals uh, and and. And those kind of stuff, not uh, the biofuel per se. Of course, you have companies uh, who are still working on that uh, and and trying to upscale the technology. In US, it has been uh, funded by Department of Energy for several decades now. Uh, the the algae two biofuel program. Uh, but if you see a product in the market, uh, I'm not so sure. But Algenol is trying uh, this to 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 get better. Uh, you also ask to compare the let's say between the algae and the microbial route. So. If you look at the literature, let's say in, of last five years, uh, as I mentioned during my presentation, uh, this bionic leaf technology, it's already beats, um, uh, you know, the, the cyanobacterial photosynthesis, especially when you com combine these uh, silic uh, silicon or gallium arsenide based uh, solar photovoltaics. It actually, in terms of efficiency, uh, direct photon to, uh, to the fuel efficiency, it, it beats that. Uh, at the same time, in terms of uh, uh, microbial approaches, uh, the route suggested uh, by Barstow is indeed uh, to bring together as many pathways as possible in a single bacteria. Easier said than done, really challenging, but I, you never say never, eh? you never know. And only yesterday there was a paper from KAISTE, Korean Institute of Science and Technology in Nature Microbiology, where they engineered E. coli, the most simple bacteria, which can actually grow only on CO2 and formate. So it's possible, it takes uh, time and years of development, but once you are there, then it's uh, it's possible. And then uh, the Lanza Tech has built their business, as you see, of gas fermentation on, on, on such type of bacteria only. Well, thank you so much for, again, an optimistic view here on, uh, you know, the development of solar fuels. I want to say that, uh, you know, we're, we're optimists as well, and, uh, you know, definitely hoping for, for some good outcomes here. You know, I'm seeing that it's just about time for our panel to close. I, I do see that we have a couple of questions from the public. And so I was just thinking uh, the first question here, which I am going to answer live, um, I was going to invite Denis to answer this question from Svetelina, uh, who's asking, uh, well, first of all, thank you for the great presentation and uh, asking if you've ever um, thought about using uh, storage in your system when uh, you use photovoltaics. Yes. Thank you for, for, for the question. And uh, I'm not sure about uh, if it refers to uh, electrical energy storage or whether it, um, it is about uh, hydrogen storage, but uh, I would say that uh, both are um, valuable options. Um, so I, I imagine that the question is more about um, maximizing the number of operating hours uh, of the electrolyzer by putting some uh, batteries in combination with the solar PV plant uh, to actually deliver a kind of uh, constant uh, flow to the electrolyzer. Um, to my knowledge, uh, we have not been involved in such a project um, right now, uh, but we know some projects which are actually um, being developed today on this concept. Um, I, I'm, I'm curious to see the complete business case because uh, when you include actually a battery energy storage into the equation, 
you are also increasing um, your price of electricity. Uh, and I don't know what, what is the, the answer, whether it's more economic or, or not than, um, than without the, the storage. But also uh, when um, we are uh, dealing with um, electrofuels, uh, with all the technologies, um, ammonia, methanol, there is also the challenge of intermittency. Um, and in, indeed, you cannot expect uh, to deliver an, an intermittent flow of hydrogen to an ammonia synthesis plant, for instance. And then in that case, uh, you need to foresee uh, some um, hydrogen uh, buffer storage uh, to make sure that you can operate uh, the uh, synthesis loop uh, in some kind of uh, more or less constant. They, they, they are working actually on, on making those type of uh, uh, synthesis more flexible. Uh, and so in that, case, in that case, you would need um, to buffer the um, hydrogen. That's something when you have a complete infrastructure in place and with a lot of pipelines, uh, you would actually not bother too much. Uh, if you produce too much hydrogen, you would inject it into a pipeline. And if you need more, you would take it from the pipeline. And so on the long term, there will be many synergies between all those um, uh, projects. I hope I answered the question. Thank you. I mean, definitely answers the question for me. And, uh, you know, I think I, I get a better understanding. And I think perhaps, you know, the, the, the question was, uh, you know, is it, is it more efficient to have a, a battery, I suppose, or to have your, your hydrogen buffer uh, on, the, on the downstream side? And uh, you know, I think you've answered it well, so, so many thanks. Uh, we have another question for you, Denis, um, if you don't mind. Um, I have uh, Sonia Kalman from Helmholtz uh, Zentrum Berlin asking uh, what the biggest bottleneck is to achieving gigawatt scale manufacturing capacity for electrolyzers. That's a nice one. I get it every time. And, and a simple answer for me, it's time. Uh, the main challenge is to um, um, manage the little time we have to grow to the gigawatt scale. Uh, and in, in, in this respect, um, we are working quite a lot on the product standardization. Uh, because a couple of years ago, uh, we were not really manufacturing products, uh, but we were manufacturing projects meaning that every project was a little bit different from the other one. Uh, so now what we try to do is to get our clients and say, look, this is what we can offer and we'll not make any deviation from it because if we start to enter the discussion, then we lose a lot of time. So product standardization is clearly um, one, um, one challenge and also um, a coordination of all the actors across the value chain to uh, grow uh, together at the same time and at the right time. We could actually start to have a gigawatt capacity today, but in fact, everyone is talking about gigawatt projects, but nobody is buying today gigawatts of electrolyzers. Mm. Uh, so there are a lot of expectations, a lot of press releases, but a lot of them, they are still empty projects. Uh, nobody is willing to put money because there is no business case behind those projects. So um, on our side, um, we are very careful on actually um, making announcements or even investing into additional capacity as long as we don't see really those projects getting into a kind of mature, maturity uh, scale. Uh, but I am pretty sure that uh, as soon as uh, all the regulatory framework will be uh, in place and we generate the business case for large scale projects, uh, there will be um, a big race um, actually to increase the capacity um, and um, I, but we can expect a lot of tensions in the value chain as there was uh, for solar PV uh, in the years uh, 2006 to 2009, for instance. Uh, I'm sure that on some of the components, uh, it will be difficult to, to procure them. And there will be some tension and then it will really go uh, massively uh, in, a, in a second phase. So time uh, is really the, the one word answer to that, uh, to that question. Yeah, I think that definitely brings up a lot of uh, you know points as well that we hope to uh, kind of uh, cover a little bit uh, maybe maybe later as well. Just the factor of time and uh, you know when when we might be achieving uh, you know the, the hydrogen economy as uh, some people like to call it. So um, I, I do have an additional question here from Anais de Tourner from King's College London. Uh, this is not addressed to anyone in particular on the panel. So uh, you know please feel free to kind of speak up if uh, if you feel like uh, you might have an answer to give here. It's a uh, Anais is wondering if uh, uh, just how much it would cost for countries like Australia, which is currently a coal exporter, uh, to convert their infrastructures into um, something that's more able to uh, produce solar fuels. 
uh, and just even in, in Europe, considering the pipelines for, uh, you know, importing gas and fuel, uh, you know, what, what, what are we looking at in terms of costs, in terms of uh, investments? So, um, you know, this is definitely, I'm just going to go ahead and say it, this is definitely a difficult question, I believe. Uh, you know, I, I, essentially, you know, um, just to give you a bit of background on this project, we did uh, model uh, costs of, of all these solar fuel technologies, but, um, uh, you know, the cost of infrastructure, the cost of developing the infrastructure required to, uh, you know, distribute these products to market was not, this is this was not included in the scope uh, of the project, and I, and I believe it would be a a fairly difficult question to answer, uh, just given the number of different scenarios that could play out for the development of solar fuel. So, um, you know, it, I, I would definitely turn to uh, to you, uh, you know, Denise, Sophia, Deepak, as industry experts, if you have any idea of these costs uh, um, and any any figure in mind. Yes, so it's a really a difficult uh, and interesting question, huh? um, but billions for sure. Um, Concerning the pipeline for Europe, um, I think there has been some uh, cost estimate actually to start converting the uh, natural gas infrastructure to hydrogen. And I don't have the numbers in, in mind, but um, I think it's not that, uh, it's not that big uh, because most of the um, pipelines which are used today from um, natural gas uh, could be used also for um, hydrogen. And then you would need uh, mainly to invest into uh, new uh, compression uh, stations that would be, uh, say, compatible from hydrogen uh, in all the, the metering devices, uh, actually to measure the hydrogen flow instead of uh, natural gas flows and everything which is related to, to safety, etc. cetera. Um, and so I would refer to this. Concerning the, the question about Australia, it's very difficult because uh, we are comparing um, Apple with peers here. Um, I mean, con take, coal is, is, is not the same uh, as, as, as solar fuels. So um, I, I would refer to actually the previous answer that, uh, that I gave concerning the, uh, the, 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 the trade of and, and the transport of hydrogen uh, between the, the, the different continents. Um, obviously, uh, th there is a, a major challenge in terms of cost concerning the, 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 the ships that are going to transport uh, those, um, those solar fuels, but I think it would not be more than what we is, is already available today. There are already big tankers um, on, on, on ships. Uh, there is no reason that it would be more expensive for solar fuels. So on that respect, I would think it's more or less the same. Okay, well, many thanks for that uh, clear and honest answer. I think that Philippe has his hand raised and might want to add something to the discussion. Uh, yes, I'd like to, to mention, in fact, this, it is a very good question. And uh, as Dov Dennis was mentioning, when she was stating, I think it's, uh, we are not even speaking about billions, we are probably speaking about thousands of billions. Uh, but I think something we should always remember is what is happening to this coal industry in the case of Australia. Uh, because this is something that sort of, uh, in all our discussion, we also have to consider is those industry have uh, already a strong economic, they have a lot of workers, a lot of people working for them, is, you know, how do we also uh, introduce not only changing an infrastructure, but making sure that the people will find new jobs when those jobs will disappear. I think it's an aspect that we tend to uh, to forget sometimes in in, in our discussion. As I only, uh, sorry, I only wanted to mention it. So, uh, so it's not only putting euros on the table; it's also having a policy that take uh, an encompassing view uh, of of the problem. That's a great point, absolutely, and brings up obviously the just transition here in, in, in Europe. And I think every single uh, country out there that has a, a coal is a, is is considering uh, you know how to enable the transition. Um, you know, and uh, definitely very interesting points. Uh, you know, I'm I'm I think uh, that the flow of questions has uh, trickled uh, down a little bit. So uh, you know, if anybody else has additional questions that you might have, uh, you know, now's the time. Um, we have a break uh, that is scheduled for uh, five minutes from now, um, but you know, perhaps if any of the panelists have questions, uh, you know, regarding e each other's presentations, uh, 
I would of course invite you to please feel free to um, to let me know and uh, you know uh, uh, or or you know I, I believe yeah Philippe has his hand raised again though that was um, perhaps just a a brief uh, passage so um, yeah I you know perhaps uh, you know Deepak if you have any additional questions of uh, of the other panelists that you might want to ask um, uh, please feel free you know. Um, and, and if not, uh, happy to kind of uh, move on to a break. So, so let me know. I just wanted to add one thing to what uh, Dennis said about the natural gas pipeline. So actually the whole uh, power to gas, uh, especially the methane people are also relying on the existence of that network. Eh? So because they can write piggyback on it and they don't have to create an additional network for that. So, so, so that helps actually in the uptake of that technology as well. Well, great. Thank you for that. Oh, me? Maybe, um, Nicolas, I have a, I have a question. Uh, I did not attend the, the session the, this morning, etc. But um, I understand that uh, the aim of the consortium is to produce directly fuels um, using uh, solar ir irradiation. Um, my presentation was about um, solar power to hydrogen, and then hydrogen to fuels, mm -hmm. which is something that, that we see um, on, the, on the short to medium term. Um, do you expect that you are going to beat that pathway uh, through what is going by making a direct conversion from solar to fumes? Uh, because I would, I, I would expect that uh, being the first uh, and actually using very mature technologies um, will have a lot of influence actually on, on the success of the technologies uh, being uh, researched uh, today. Denis, that's a fantastic question, and I think you've actually just summarized our entire project in about two uh, two sentences. So uh, you know, I'm just going to take the recording and write that that down. So no, I, I, I thank you so much. That's a great question. Uh, I, I just wanted to yeah maybe clarify very briefly that indeed we're looking at all options uh, for producing solar fuel. So that uh, you know that doesn't that doesn't mean just the um, uh, just the direct uh, conversion of uh, of solar to hydrogen. Uh, in fact, we're I think that our, our report focused mostly or, or you know, quite, quite substantially on some of the more mature technologies that we see uh, coming to market sooner indeed, uh, including you know, uh, uh, PEMEC, you know, proton uh, exchange membrane neutralizers, uh, you know, and, and some of the more mature technologies that, that can uh, you know, quite soon or you know, in, indeed now uh, start producing hydrogen from, uh, from electricity. Um, so you know, just to give you again a brief overview, uh, we looked at these um, at a number of different pathways. You know the, the electrochemical pathways, uh, some more sort of uh, high high temperature uh, electrolysis. Uh, you know solar thermochemical pathways, the the the, the um, chemical pathways, the biochemical pathways for uh, uh, solar fuels, including microalgae. So um, we looked at a number of different pathways indeed, and uh, and and came to the same conclusions as you. I think that uh, you know what might come to market sooner indeed is um, is these uh, you know solar to hydrogen to fuel pathways? Um, yeah, that that that's generally our conclusion as well. Okay, thank you. Cheers, thank you. So I think that we actually are just on time here, just in ske on schedule uh, to take a short break. I believe uh, it is scheduled for fifteen minutes, and um, so I would invite you to uh, reconnect at ten to four. Uh, and please do feel free to, you know, let it, let it run, um, stay on mute and uh, connect in 15 minutes just for our presentation of project results where um, my colleague Bodin and myself will be presenting some of the results that uh, we had on the, the economic roadmap and the market outlook for uh, sustainable solar fuels to 2050 and 2100. Thank you.
Good afternoon, everyone. This is uh, Nick Merriman, and we are back from our coffee break with um, the last part of our conference, which is going to be focusing on the presentation of the project results, uh, and specifically looking at the economic roadmap and market outlook that we've produced, uh, looking at the sustainable production, uh, the production of sustainable solar fuels to 2050 and 2100. And this presentation will be uh, essentially undertaken by uh, myself and my colleague, Corinne. So I'm just going to give uh, just one more minute for anybody who, uh, you know, might have actually gone for a coffee, coming back with their coffee, uh, just, uh, you know, 30 more seconds for, for everyone to be able to join. Um, and I want to thank you again for your attendance today. I know, you know, it's uh, been a long day full of results, uh, but I hope that you're excited for this last part of it. Uh, we'll be tying in some of the insights from the Techno uh, technological roadmap. We'll be talking about, uh, uh, you know, the market maturity of various technologies. So, uh, you know, I think that this uh, this will be a, maybe a good way to uh, really tie the the, the conclusions and uh, tie, to bring together, I think, insights from uh, a number of parts of the project. Uh, we do have a Q and A planned here, so you might have a, a chance to ask your your final questions. So I think that's time, and um, we can get started here with our economic roadmap and market outlook. So um, beautiful. This um, figure here uh, is a short, essentially an overview of uh, the, the model mechanics uh, that, we, uh, that we applied uh, to look at the costs of uh, various solar fuel uh, technologies in it. And here, I just want to give a very brief overview just to say that uh, essentially the, the model um, uh, looks at uh, various stages of uh, solar fuel production. Uh, starting with all the way to the left here, uh, we, we see energy sources, um, including, of course, solar uh, PV. But uh, you know, we've we've modeled uh, wind power inputs to the system as well um, as an option. Um, in a second stage, we have the production of hydrogen uh, with uh, three different um, technologies modeled uh, here. Three different uh, electrolysis technologies modeled. Uh, you know, alkaline electrolysis, uh, 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 proton. Um, uh, exchange membrane uh, electrolysis and uh, solid oxide electrolysis. So um, uh, we, of course, have looked at uh, photoelectrochemical cells as well, which is, a, a, you know, as discussed earlier, a, a one-step process um, uh, converting uh, sun energy directly into, into hydrogen. Um, all these technologies then produce hydrogen, which, uh, uh, from which we can uh, uh, do a number of things in a third stage. So, uh, you know, the three boxes here to the right Methanol, ethanol, and methane um, illustrate some of the the potential, um, you know, hydrocarbon fuels uh, that can be produced uh, based on on the solar hydrogen. Um, at the bottom in gray, uh, what we have is uh, some of the comparable uh, fossil fuel based benchmarking technologies that we've included. Uh, you know, starting from natural gas as a base uh, as a base point, and then looking at steam methane reforming uh, that that produces hydrogen and that competes with um, with the green hydrogen and um, and the methanol process, which essentially uh, produces uh, you know again methanol from um, from hydrogen. So that's a, a short overview of uh, the overall structure. Uh, but just again to go back to uh, what we are modeling uh, specifically, what we're looking at is the levelized cost of energy uh, for these various technologies, and that's of course uh, if you're not familiar, a, a widely used methodology. Uh, that is uh, commonly used to benchmark uh, the costs of uh, energy technologies, and that and it, and it's, uh, it's an, what it is really is just uh, the the sum of the costs uh, of the technology over the lifetime um, divided by uh, the sum of the electrical energy or or, or generally energy uh, produced over its lifetime. So um, our own model is built uh, to produce to give the the plant it cost of production for each technology. Um, We've looked at uh, six regions in particular, uh, including Africa, Asia, Australia, New Zealand, Europe, North America, and South America. Um, of course, uh, our model is based on a, a, a set of assumptions, and I'll be covering some of them uh, in a later slide. Um, we do have three different, essentially, uh, levels of optimism, or, or, or you know, these are kind of uh, lower and upper bounds um, for the assumptions, and that gives us a little bit of a sensitivity analysis uh, for the, the, the modeled costs. And then what we've done is uh, we've modeled two different growth scenarios, essentially looking at uh, a stable scenario where uh, investments in uh, these solar fuel technologies remain 
relatively stable. Um, and, and then another scenario uh, where we really scale up uh, the investment in these technologies and really aggressively push towards uh, decarbonization uh, through these, uh, these solar fuel technologies. So uh, another short, a brief overview of the, um, of the model mechanics. Uh, what you see here is that uh, the various components going into the LCOE, the, the principal components really are uh, capital expenditures, uh, operating maintenance, um, energy inputs, and then other operating costs. And uh, what, we, what we have going into CapEx, into capital expenditures, uh, is uh, really we're looking at uh, per kilowatt of installed capacity, uh, and we're applying a learning curve to see how that CapEx evolves over time, uh, all the way to 2100. Uh, this learning curve is based on some uh, established parameters that we found in the literature, uh, discussed with uh, stakeholders through uh, three stakeholder workshops that we held, uh, I think, over the course of June. And, um, and so we've, we've refined these estimates uh, uh, over the course of the project to really get uh, a more solid understanding of, of uh, what the learning curve might be for these various technologies. So, uh, you know, if you're unfamiliar with the learning curve, just briefly, I mean, it's the idea that uh, as, as you grow in installed capacity of a given technology, you're going to be learning, uh, you're going to be uh, applying some learnings to reduce uh, costs. And so, uh, you know, the rate at which you learn obviously depends, uh, the rate uh, uh, impacts the, the, the rate of, uh, of, of your cost reduction. So we're modeling the, the CapEx into the future. We're also looking at uh, operating maintenance, which is considered to be a, a percentage of capital costs. Um, we're looking at energy inputs as well. Uh, of course, that's a key component. Um, you know, for the first stage uh, technologies where we're looking at uh, the production of green hydrogen from solar PV, uh, we have uh, the cost of solar PV as a, an input variable um, and considering the efficiency of each technology, of course. So, um, you know, one of the key drivers uh, as well of, of these various technologies is looking at the, the energy efficiency uh, per kilowatt hour of energy inputs. Um, in, in the energy inputs uh, component, we're looking at, of course, the solar irradiation, irradiation uh, factor as well. Um, so this is where the geographical uh, distribution comes into play, uh, where we've modeled uh, for different regions, uh, a different cost for, for energy uh, based on, on you know, what we estimate to be the levelized cost of energy for um, solar PV in these regions. And then of course, we have a few uh, other operating costs including labor, uh, you know, the, the costs of, uh, of CO2 as a resource. Uh, when we consider, uh, you know, the hydrocarbon solar fuels, we're, we're looking at uh, carbon dioxide, of course, as, as a resource, uh, uh, considering uh, CO2 from um, uh, carbon capture and uh, utilization. Um, so that obviously has a cost. Uh, we look at the cost of, uh, of water, uh, the cost of uh, carbon dioxide emissions, um, so pricing in the, 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 carbon, the carbon price, and, uh, and, and we've modeled that into the future as well, based on some assumptions, uh, and then waste, waste disposal costs come into play as well. Uh, just a quick note is that we've also modeled the revenue, of course, uh, for any byproducts. And as mentioned earlier, you know, uh, I think Denis uh, mentioned in his presentation that, of course, you, know, you have oxygen as a byproduct as a, of electrolysis, so uh, we factored that in as well. Um, some of the, the a little few words on the technologies that we've modeled, uh, and they include, um, you know, some more mature technologies like um, alkaline electrolysis, uh, and some then some some much more, you know, low TRL technologies, uh, you know, including the, the photoelectrochemical cell. Uh, some of the technologies included in our technology roadmap, uh, you know, including the bionic leaf, the artificial leaf, uh, we have not modeled in our in our LCOE model. Uh, due to limitations on uh, essentially the input parameters and uh, and uh, you know the low availability of information uh, just to be able to model uh, a commercial scale uh, production of these uh, of of these technologies. So um, some of the assumptions that I want to briefly cover here is that uh, we use a discount rate just to kind of uh, be able to annualize the capital costs. Um, and really be able to, uh, you know, factor in the, the higher cost of capital uh, in some regions. But, you know, of course, there's a, a number of other uh, regional variations that we can't take into account. Uh, again, speaking of regional variations, uh, we've considered solar irradiance um, within a region to be fixed, 
so that, of course, um, you know, means that for Europe, we've modeled an average um, between an average across Europe, um, uh, which, which corresponds to a sort of average situation. But obviously, you know, if you're developing uh, a solar fuel plant, you will be, uh, as, as Sophia said earlier today, you'll be optimizing for that, trying to uh, go for the regions that have uh, that are uh, essentially just much, much sunnier, uh, you know, such as southern Spain. So um, these are some of the assumptions. And just without further ado, I'd like to um, hand it over to my colleague, Pauline, who will be presenting uh, some of the results here of the LCOE model. Thank you, Nick. So indeed, um, I'll be presenting the LCOE results, um, focusing on Europe and looking at two, the two investment scenarios uh, that we discussed, so it's the stable investment scenario and also a scale investment scenario um, characterized by uh, an investment push. So we'll do this analysis per fuel, um, starting with the, the hydrogen system. So uh, under the system, the, the technologies we're looking at here are um, the ones discussed uh, that were discussed this morning and this afternoon as well, being PEMEC, AEC, SOEC, PEC, but also their uh, gray counterpart, um, steam methane reforming. So this, in this first graph here, um, we're looking at the LCU evolution of the, the green technologies under a stable investment scenario. So what we can really see is that, as discussed this morning, AEC currently benefits from a cost advantage amongst the green hydrogen technologies. Uh, with that said, PEMEC is essentially expected to become uh, the most cost competitive technology with uh, a rapidly declining um, LCOE, which is expected to surpass that of AEC from 2030 onwards. Um, this decline being partly due to, uh, to, to reduction in, in PEMEC's CAPEX, notably. We can also see here um, a significant LCOE decline for the SOEC technology, primarily also due to uh, CAPEX improvement. Um, and SOEC reaches um, LCOE parity with AEC in approximately 2055. Another key takeaway, uh, as we can see, is that PEC is modeled, as we discussed earlier, from 2050 onwards, when, well, based on, on expert inputs and, and discussions, uh, we've established that manufacturing PEC systems at commercial scale uh, may become viable. So due to reductions in, uh, in PEC, uh, CAPEX, uh, we can see that the technology displays a, a significant decrease in its LCOE from 2050, and that by a negligible margin, it becomes cost competitive with SOEC by um, 2100 uh, under a stable scenario. So um, overall, I think one key takeaway from this slide is essentially that PEMEC is therefore expected to become, uh, from our analysis, the most cost competitive green hydrogen technology in the next 10 years under this scenario. So moving on to, to the next slide, um, we can, um, the, the next slide will report reports on the, the, the scale growth scenario for the same technologies. So here, essentially, what we can see with this uh, investment push is that PEMEC and SOEC uh, should become cost competitive with AEC in around 2027 and 2037, respectively. Um, we can also observe that the technologies, uh, the two technologies then level out through uh, 2100. So in this scenario, we can also observe a lower performance of the, of the PEC technology, which despite some uh, strong LCOE decrease um, remains the least affordable technology through uh, 2100. To conclude that, uh, this slide essentially highlights that an investment push scenario would uh, mostly benefit the PEMEC and SCOE technologies. So drawing on this, uh, on this analysis, on these two slides, um, for all green hydrogen technologies, what we can really see is that essentially PEMEC stands out as the most promising uh, study technology, uh, given its cost competitiveness in both scenarios. So the next graph um, well, therefore, um, therefore dives into PEMEX LCOE under both a scale and stable scenario and compares it with its gray hydrogen e equivalent as uh, team methane reforming. So here, um, this graph is really key to our study since it highlights that uh, PEMEX is expected to become cost competitive with SMR um, in uh, 2048 under stable investment scenario. Um, this is essentially the result of PEMEX declining LCOE through 2100, uh, um, together with a continuously rising LCOE for SMR, which is primarily uh, the result of uh, the increase in uh, natural gas costs and also in CO2 emission costs of the SMR technology. Um, what we can see as well is that uh, in an investment push scenario, 
Femec is expected to, to foresee, uh, to, sorry, to surpass uh, SMR as early as uh, 2039 uh, at about 4.55 euros uh, per kilogram of hydrogen produced. So uh, moving on to the, the methanol uh, system, the, the, the technology that is considered here is the, the CO2 hydrogenation technology, which uses, um, as outlined by my colleague Nick earlier, which uses the green hydrogen uh, produced by the PEMEC technology. So the, the fossil benchmark used here uh, for the analysis is um, uh, motor gasoline. So what we can see is that in a normal investment scenario, CO2 hydrogenation could become cost competitive with gasoline in 2053. Um, this decrease in the technologies uh, LCOE is primarily driven by the, the decline in the cost of the green hydrogen resulting from PEMEC, but also due to a drop in the price of CO2 as a resource captured from uh, uh, carbon capture and storage and utilization. Against this, uh, we can really uh, clearly see on this graph the, the, the cost of uh, the rising cost of motor gasoline, uh, which includes an expectedly rising carbon price in Europe. Um, and so the cost of motor gasoline is essentially forcing to double to 2060. Um, therefore, um, in a scale scenario, the conclusion here uh, is that CO2 hydrogenation could essentially become cost competitive uh, against uh, motor gasoline as early as 2042. Now looking at the ethanol system, uh, the technology that is considered here uh, for, for ethanol production is the microalgae technology. So uh, similar to methanol, the fossil benchmark used here is gasoline. Um, so what we can really see here is that despite a rapid decline of uh, microalgae technology, uh, LCRE, excuse me, until 2050, um, the technology does not reach cost competitiveness with gasoline in the study period and under both investment scenarios. So this graph essentially reflects um, the technology's current low maturity and, and relative inefficiency, uh, essentially characterized by uh, very high capex and overhead, overhead and maintenance costs through um, 2100. So overall, on the short term, it is uh, unlikely that um, microalgae is considered a, a very promising social technology given the, the stronger performance of its steer electrolyzer technologies, amongst others. So now moving on to a uh, methane system, um, we are now looking at uh, the power to methane technology uh, under the two stable scale investment scenarios and using natural gas as a benchmark. So um, what is um, out highlighted here are the significant LCOE improvements uh, of the technology under the, both in, uh, the two investment scenarios, uh, where we can observe a clear decline of, um, of the LCOE to um, 2050. Um, this decline is primarily explained by decreasing CAPEX and also uh, decreasing green H2 costs uh, resulting from the, the hydrogen technologies. So in a scale investment uh, scenario, we can observe that power to methane reaches cost parity with uh, natural gas in 2060. So this is essentially partly due to the, the slow increase in natural gas prices compared to oil products, um, primarily explained by uh, natural gas's availability and lower carbon footprint. And within this, uh, essentially carbon pricing is still expected to be the, the main driver of natural gas uh, price increase. And by 2060, we actually expect that carbon pricing represents um, around half of natural gases price. So based on this, uh, on this context, uh, power to methane is expected to reach cost competitiveness with natural gas in uh, 2060 in a scale scenario. In a normal investment scenario, on the other hand, uh, the technology should attain a cost parity with natural gas um, at around 2090. So um, this graph now looks at the, the decomposed LCRE of all the studied technologies um, with the different components, uh, technology and economic components that, uh, that, um, that consist that are included in our model. Um, and we look at this for uh, 2020 in Europe under a stable investment scenario. So the key takeaways here are really that production costs and most specifically energy input costs are the key drivers of the hydrogen system technologies LCOE, namely um, so AEC, PEMEC, SOEC, SMR, which you can see at the, at the top um, of the chart here. 
Um, we can observe the high share of CO2 emission costs uh, of the SMR technology relative, of course, to its um, green counterparts. Um, and in contrast to this, um, on, the, on the bottom line uh, of the graph, we can see uh, the, um, the, that CO2 hydrogenation and power to methane both incur high green hydrogen input costs as they rely, uh, as previously said, on the H2 produced from the hydrogen system technologies. Another takeaway uh, from this chart here is that both wind power and, and solar are, are mostly, as you are mostly driven uh, by capital expenditure costs, as they require no uh, additional energy input and have relatively low operating costs. Finally, um, looking at, uh, at microalgae on the, on the bottom row, uh, we can see that uh, the technology incurs high capex as well as high uh, overhead and maintenance costs, which largely reflects the, the low maturity of the technology. So overall, um, looking at the LCOE levels, which are at the, the center of the, of the bubbles, of the charts, um, we can essentially see that the, the fossil-based technologies, namely SMR and MV, uh, currently benefit from a cost advantage over their green counterparts, and that amongst the green technologies currently in 2020 in Europe, AC displays the, the lowest LCOE. Now, uh, the next slide will display the, the, the same graph, however, looking at uh, a forward-looking graph uh, for the year 2050. So what we can observe uh, from the, the, these charts here is that although uh, decreased, the energy input costs uh, remain the largest cost driver in the, the hydrogen technologies um, LCOE. Uh, another key takeaway here is that uh, PEC is now modeled uh, from 2050 onwards and displays high capex and overhead and maintenance costs. Um, we can also observe the increased uh, cost of CO2 emissions for SMR, which now represents 35% of the technologies LCOE, so which is definitely not uh, negligible. Um, we can similarly uh, observe the, the green H2 costs um, remaining uh, quite important for the CO2 hydrogenation and power to methane technology. And finally, uh, looking at microalgae, we can see that, um, that the, the, the technology displays uh, decreased uh, capex levels, uh, which are essentially surpassed by overhead and maintenance costs. Um, so what we can draw from this essentially that this demonstrates the increasing maturity of the technology in 2050, although uh, still faced with, uh, with challenges linked to efficiency notably. So overall, uh, what we can say is that compared with uh, the previous chart uh, in 2020, uh, what we see now is that the, the technology benefiting from a cost advantage is PEMEC, uh, followed by SMR uh, and power to methane, which display equal series uh, in this period at this time, uh, point in time. So um, that, these are the, the, the key results of our SCRE analysis. Uh, which are very which very much paved the way for the the following uh, market outlook uh, analysis for solar fuels which my colleague Nick Merriman will be presenting thank you very much Pauline uh, no I want to thank you for that great presentation essentially the the, the economic roadmap that we've produced here uh, is really looking forward to the the, the costs of these potential um, uh, technologies and in the next step what what we've done is uh, We've looked at what could be the market um, to 2050 and 2100 for solar fuels, given you know, given the the changing energy mix in uh, in uh, you know worldwide, uh, given given uh, scenarios for uh, decarbonization, and given a number of other assumptions. So, uh, just to give you here a brief overlook of the the the, uh, the model that we've uh, we've developed, uh, looks at um, three different scenarios for. Uh, decarbonization uh, in, in each of the regions that we've studied. Uh, we have a reference scenario <clears throat> which uh, models, uh, it's a bit of a baseline scenario that models, um, uh, that models policies in place uh, um, by 2019 in the various jurisdictions. Um, we have another scenario, the two-degree scenario, which is a bit of a middle-of-the-road scenario that models uh, a, a two-degree uh, Celsius uh, global temperature rise uh, to 2100, uh, you know, relative to pre-industrial levels, uh, and essentially models, as I said, uh, the required uh, investments and efforts uh, by, uh, you know, by all countries to uh, reach this uh, this target. Um, we then have a bit more of an ambitious scenario, the, the 1.5 degrees warming scenario, uh, which is, uh, you know, similarly to the two degree scenario, 
uh, models this uh, 1.5 degrees of global temperature rise. Um, so as I said, we've done so for six different uh, regions, um, comprising again, uh, you know, similarly to the LCOE model, Africa, Asia, Australia, New Zealand, Europe, North America, and South America. Uh, for each region separately, we've looked at uh, GDP per capita and population growth to get forecasts of GDP growth for each region. Uh, we've then looked at the, the total final consumption of energy per unit of GDP. Um, and we've uh, coupled that with GDP growth to get an estimate of total final consumption. And what we've done with the total final consumption is we've modeled, uh, based on an exponential curve, uh, this um, total final consumption per unit of GDP, uh, considering that the energy intensity of e economies worldwide has been declining for the past 20 years at least, and uh, you know, overall on average, um, I would say, of course. And, uh, and we foresee this as, uh, as, as being a recurring trend. Uh, so we forecasted this, uh, uh, this, this, uh, this trend, uh, these trend lines to uh, 2100 based on uh, you know, a number of different uh, uh, sources of information, including uh, you know, benchmarks available in published reports. So uh, we then get an estimate of total final consumption for each of these regions, uh, which we then apply uh, to a forecasted share by sector, which again uh, has been forecasted into the future, just to uh, model the fact that you know some regions might be seeing a, a lower uh, share of their total uh, final consumption of energy uh, attributable to industry, you know, in favor of building. So uh, you know the, the industry consumption of energy might be uh, declining relative to uh, to the you know to building. So. Uh, just we forecasted these shares by sector to get an estimate of final consumption by sector. And then finally, uh, you know, we've taken it one step farther uh, by looking at each type of uh, fuel. Uh, and, and we've included uh, sort of biomass, coal, uh, e-fuels, electricity, gas, heat, hydrogen, and oil. I'll be going a little bit more over these fuels later um, in just a brief overview of, uh, of, of what they mean for a marketing outlook exercise. But uh, uh, in this case, I think it's important to remember that uh, you know we've we've looked for each region at an estimate of final consumption by sector, and then and then by sector and fuel uh, to really get a fully broken down estimate of uh, of what could be the fuel consumption uh, individual fuel, uh, fuel consumption in, in each uh, of these regions in each sector. Um, so just very briefly, I think on the scenarios, I mean, again, I I, I covered this uh, in my previous slide, but. Uh, uh, just to say that, uh, you know, the reference scenario uh, assumes that there are no new commitments to climate change mitigation occurring after 2019. Uh, so I would, say, I, would, I would like to stress that it does not reflect uh, expectations, uh, you know, that we have today for the energy transition pathways, uh, including, for example, in Europe, uh, you know, and it does not reflect uh, the European Union's uh, commitment to climate neutrality by 2050. Um, the, the two degree scenario, again, as discussed, uh, models the pathways where, where we do not exceed uh, two degrees of uh, global temperature rise. And then, you know, the 1.5 degree scenario, for instance, I would say is the one that most closely models um, the, the, this uh, commitment by the European Union uh, to carbon neutrality. So uh, that's just to kind of uh, remind you that, you know, across all uh, three scenarios that we've modeled, there might be different uh, expectations as to what is most likely to occur um, to 2050 and 2100. Of course, uh, you know, looking into the future, as Sophia said earlier, uh, it's always quite, uh, you know, difficult. It's fraught with, uh, you know, a number of uh, challenges, and 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 you have to make assumptions. But but here are the the, the assumptions, the main assumptions that we've made. Um, just a little bit more here on the mechanics of what we've done. Uh, you know, beyond looking at uh, the final consumption by by sector and fuel. Uh, what we also wanted to give as information or, or you know, what we also wanted to, uh, to analyze uh, was potentially the, um, the investments that would be required to reach the targets that we've identified. So, uh, you know, given that we had all this excellent information that my colleague Corinne has presented from uh, the LCOE model, uh, what we've done is um, we've looked at the final consumption by sector and fuel of, uh, of well, essentially, We've looked at the final consumption of e-fuels and, and hydrogen in each sector. And just a little, a short word on that, you know, um, basically, as, as Pauline said, and as I think uh, we've covered, uh, you know, today is, um, you know, there are expectations that hydrogen could become cost competitive 
uh, I think with fossil fuel benchmarks by, by 2050 for sure in, uh, in most jurisdictions, especially if we consider you know, more aggressive investment in these technologies. So uh, we've considered that the model demand for hydrogen uh, could be fulfilled by solar fuels and, and, and essentially, you know, of course, should be fulfilled by solar fuels if we want to reach our targets for, uh, for decarbonization. Um, just now, a, a quick definition on e-fuels is uh, e-fuels are synthetic fuels that uh, are produced, uh, you know, based on originally electricity, and uh, you know they include e-gases and e-liquids. Uh, and you know here the definition is uh, is is just hydrocarbon fuels uh, based on these uh, on, on on these technologies, uh, which would generally, as we've seen today, take uh, you know typically electricity uh, uh, to convert to, to to be converted to hydrogen. And then, uh, you know, combined with uh, carbon dioxide um, to produce uh, to produce uh, you know hydrocarbon fuels. So um, uh, I, I would I would um, yeah the, the, the next uh, step in our in our model here was just to take the the capex uh, estimates from uh, the LCOE model where uh, you know we've assumed that again the the, the technology that seems to most likely reflect. Uh, Essentially, pathways that are expected for hydrogen production uh, from from solar energy. Uh, we've we've looked at PEMEC uh, just to have a benchmark idea of uh, you know what technology uh, would fit would be most expected to fit our needs for e-liquids. Uh, we've looked at uh, carbon uh, sorry uh, CO2 hydrogenation and uh, and for e-gases we've looked of course at power to methane and and from that we've derived these investment require, requirements by fuel. Um, so on this slide, actually, uh, you know, this is essentially what I've just said. Uh, you know, this is um, our assumptions, and I won't cover them uh, in, in more detail. But just uh, again, our assumptions for uh, you know what are e-fuels uh, and and which of our technologies might be best uh, to uh, to fit that demand. So uh, without further ado, these are some of the results of our market outlook scenarios. And here I'm going to um, just kind of say that. Uh, what, what I wanted to do here with this slide was um, show uh, the three scenarios side by side. Uh, for the sake of readability, uh, for the rest of my presentation, I focused just on the two degrees of uh, warming scenario. Uh, but here, at least you have an overview of um, what each scenario looks like as far as total final consumption uh, worldwide looks like. So uh, on the left, the reference scenario. In the middle, we have the two degree scenario. And on the right, we see the 1.5 degree scenario. So uh, just again, drilling down into the two degree scenario, what we see is that um, at the bottom, you've got Africa where uh, energy consumption rises fairly constantly all the way to 2090 and then levels off just by the end of the century. Uh, we see a, a, a quite you know, rapidly rising uh, demand in Asia, uh, peaking by say the mid 2030s and then by 2100, uh, you know, dropping back to the same levels um, that were observed around the beginning of the century. Uh, so quite a significant drop as well. Uh, energy demand in Europe declines throughout the entire forecasting horizon and uh, is down to 40% of the levels uh, observed in, in 2000 uh, by, by the end of the century. Uh, North America shares a fairly similar pathway uh, with a significant energy, decline, uh, energy demand decline as well. And then we see that uh, in South America, there's a peak around mid-century uh, and drops back to approximately 2020 levels uh, by the end of the century. So that would be the uh, total final consumption by region. Um, and here, just moving on directly now to what we see as a potential solar fuel demand. Uh, so again, the definition that we've seen for solar fuels here is just we've included uh, hydrogen and, um, and e-fuels. Um, and we see, and we wanted to show again, uh, one important trend that we see as well is, of course, electrification of our uh, final consumption of energy, so uh, including electricity as well. So we see that in this uh, middle of the road, uh, two degree scenario, solar fuels could really become a key part of our energy systems worldwide. And uh, just to give you some figures here is uh, by 2050, we estimate that they could contribute to 3.8%. Uh, uh, of our energy needs worldwide, and uh, you know, 5.8% in 2100. Now, of course, uh, you know, if I had time, I would love to give you a disaggregated picture across all uh, all, all regions, uh, where you could get a, a, a bit of an estimate of uh, you know which regions are most likely to uh, reach you know uh, uh, or essentially which regions um, in in which regions solar fuels might become more uh, competitive in the future. 
Um, but for full results, uh, you might want to read our, our report. Um, now, just moving on to each of the different sectors um, to give you a little bit of a disaggregated view. Uh, what we've seen here based on, you know, uh, again, the assumptions that were made, uh, again, based on uh, literature and on a, a conversation with, uh, with experts, uh, including the, the workshop that we held, uh, the workshops that we held in June, is uh, we see a relatively modest contribution of uh, solar fuels to uh, energy needs in industry, which amounts to uh, just 0.8% uh, in 2050 and 1.5% in 2100. Um, ultimately, we do want to acknowledge the fact that uh, the contribution of solar fuels to energy demand in industry really ultimately depends on a wide range of factors, including, of course, uh, more broadly, the cost of green versus uh, green hydrogen, uh, but really also the cost of green hydrogen versus other fossil fuels that are currently used in industrial processes. And then really, I think this is the key message is uh, how adaptable are uh, industrial processes to accept, uh, to accept hydrogen as a fuel. And I think we've heard earlier that, you know, steel is, is perhaps one of them. Um, and, and, and really essentially what we see is that um, it, it really depends on, on how likely it is uh, that hydrogen uh, generally might be uh, competitive uh, and, and be able to uh, fulfill the energy needs of industry. Uh, now moving on to transport, I think we see here just a bit more of a role for solar fuels um, in the two degree scenario. Uh, what we see is that uh, uh, solar fuels could contribute to 11% of energy demand in the transport sector in 2050, and that could rise to 15.2% in 2100. Um, we've already discussed some of them, um, some of the applications for, for example, hydrogen and fuel cell electric vehicles. Uh, and that has been modeled here, of course, um, fuel cells and, uh, sorry, for hydrogen in planes. Um, but, uh, you know, we also see uh, a big, um, essentially a big market for e-liquids in, uh, you know, including in road transport and freight, uh, where we still see some remaining internal combustion engine vehicles on the road in 2050 and, and, and even perhaps up to 2100. Um, so we also see hydrogen playing a role uh, as I said, in road transport, medium haul aviation, but uh, I don't want to forget maritime transport as well. I think there are a number of applications, uh, and I would refer you to uh, the, the, the slide in, in, in Denis' um, uh, presentation that had a great overview of some of these applications uh, uh, for hydrogen in a number of different sectors. And now just lastly, um, where do we see solar fuels contributing to uh, potential demanded buildings is, uh, you know, potentially up to 3.1% of total final consumption in uh, the building sector and 4.7% uh, in, uh, in buildings uh, in 2050 and 2100, respectively. So the most immediate uh, applicable demand that we see for hydrogen in buildings could include potentially, and there's been a number of pilot projects around this, uh, you know, blending the hydrogen directly into the gas, uh, the natural gas distribution uh, uh, system, uh, you know, the infrastructure, I think, in in a number of, uh, of, of jurisdictions is ready to accept up to, you know, say 10%. And uh, some people even, um, even expect up to 20% um, of, of hydrogen blended into our natural gas uh, system. So um, that, that could definitely be a, a directly applicable uh, uh, demand. But, you know, the other, um, the other I think the, one of the other uh, key contributions of hydrogen to buildings uh, you know, apart from, of course, uh, uh, the the um, uh, the sort of uh, unit being considered by uh, by Sophia's colleague uh, uh, that we talked about earlier, is uh, you know, for example, in Japan, uh, we've seen the deployment of a of a, of a very large number of uh, these uh, micro combined heat and power units that are being deployed to uh, you know reduce the dependence of individual buildings on the electricity grid. Uh, these are able to use uh, hydrogen as a fuel and, uh, and are based on a fuel cell that, that can provide heat and power to a, to a, you know, to a building. So, uh, you know, of course, with, uh, you know, smart control systems, uh, we see that this could help uh, mitigate temporal, uh, temporal fluctuations in the supply of electricity, uh, which is, of course, very relevant in the context of, uh, you know, renewable energy. Um, I just want to move on to my last slide for the day here, uh, which 
uh, looks at uh, the required investments that we, we see uh, modeled uh, from 2020 to 2100 to uh, essentially reach the targets that we've, uh, we've discussed. Um, so what we have here is uh, just a, a slide showing the, the annual investments that would be required um, as discussed. And, uh, and what we see here, just to give you the figure here, is um, by 2050, investments of uh, 7.3 trillion euros worldwide. Um, and uh, the uh, additional investments in the second half of the century uh, would amount to uh, 9.5 trillion, the grand total of 16.8 trillion uh, from 2020 to 2100. So uh, that is 7.3 trillion over 30 years, which would amount to uh, annual investments across the entire social value chain of uh, 236.5 billion euros. Uh, and that is of course worldwide. Um, from 2050 to 2100, uh, you know, these average total annual investments decline uh, slightly due to uh, you know, substantial reductions in capital expenditure costs. So despite the fact that, of course, we'll be producing, producing many more solar fuels as, uh, as anticipated earlier, uh, you know, the, the individual cost uh, uh, is, is much lower. And so what we see is total annual, and, and sorry, I should say uh, the individual, the capex, the capital expenditure required here uh, is, is quite a bit lower. And so what we see is uh, capital investments of uh, 190 billion euros per year um, to 2100. So obviously, you know, I just maybe want to conclude this by saying uh, these are obviously very high figures um, and, and present maybe um, a, 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 an ideal uh, picture of, of, of investment. Uh, as you might see here, uh, one thing I want to point out is this uh, takes into account the scale uh, growth scenario. Um, so uh, you know, modeling it slightly relatively aggressive investment in the technologies. Um, these are perhaps relatively high figures, but I think if you, uh, you know, of course, compare them to world GDP, uh, you know, I, I believe that uh, these are realistic targets and that, uh, you know, uh, of course, uh, the ramp might not look like uh, what, what is displayed here in the graph, uh, it might be a slower ramp up. Uh, we, we will not be investing uh, that much uh, here now in 2020, but uh, we, we very much believe that these are achievable targets and, uh, and that these are required to, uh, to reach our uh, ambitious goals in terms of decarbonization of our energy needs worldwide. Uh, so that concludes it for our presentation of the market outlook and, uh, sorry, economic roadmap and market outlook. Um, just looking at the time here, uh, I think that we are a little bit past time, but we definitely have time for a bit of um, a Q&A. So I'm just gonna ask my colleague Putin to share a slide here and I will stop sharing that way I can um, field your questions. I see that there have been a few questions uh, and that is beautiful. Um, of course, I will be mostly addressing them to myself. Um, but let's see, these are, are fantastic questions. I see Anaïs de Tournel again. Um, many thanks for your question here. Uh, Anaïs is asking us um, on the slide uh, with the solar fuels economic roadmap, the LCD model, we capture the solar energy and we use it to produce hydrogen. And this production discharges methanol and methane into the atmosphere. Um, I think perhaps I can take this question here and just kind of clarify that, uh, you know, I. Not exactly sure which slide exactly uh, you're referring to. I believe it probably was the first, the very first slide. Uh, just to clarify, the, the model that we've used captures, uh, the, the pathway that we've modeled uh, captures solar energy, uses it to produce hydrogen, and then we apply, um, we, we combine, that is combined with carbon dioxide from uh, carbon capture and utilization to produce methanol. Um, through uh, uh, CO2 hydrogenation. And similarly, uh, the pathway for power to methane, methane uh, I think is a well-established pathway that, um, that, that utilizes uh, you know, uh, hydrogen and carbon dioxide to, to create methane. So um, again, uh, there's no release of methanol and methane into the atmosphere here. The, the idea is to use methanol and methane as a fuel as they might have different applications 
uh, relative to hydrogen. So I, I hope, Anais, that that uh, answers your question. Um, I believe that we also have, uh, well, we have a few more questions here uh, that I will be addressing from the Q&A. Um, and I uh, have Alexandro that um, asks, oh, sorry, um, let, let me go here in sequential order. Uh, Remco asking me, uh, well, thank you for the nice presentation. Um, well, thank you. Uh, and Remco asks uh, whether we can comment on our assumptions for the price of carbon dioxide as a resource and as uh, an emission price tax. Now, I have to be honest with you, Remco, I do not recall all of the exact figures, uh, but thankfully I, I can recall one um, for the price of uh, carbon that we've assumed for Europe in 2050. And I think that that was amounting to 178 euros per ton of carbon dioxide. Now, of course, you know, current, um, uh, levels are around 25 euros. Uh, and so, you know, that does imply a fairly steep rise uh, in the carbon price. Um, and depending on who you speak, uh, they might interpret it indeed as steep uh, to who you speak to. But uh, I think a lot of people as well are, are anticipating that, um, you know, the carbon price could rise substantially in the coming years. And, you know, I, I'd like to point out to the example of Germany, uh, where, you know, the, the German government has uh, laid out a plan for sort of stepwise increase in the carbon price uh, that, uh, you know, I think reaches, I, think, I believe, if I'm not mistaken, 90 euros per ton uh, in, the, in, in, in a, a very short time horizon. Um, so not exactly unrealistic to believe that uh, this, this carbon price could reach those levels. And uh, for the carbon resource price, I would have to get back to you. Again, here we've modeled the decline in the price of uh, carbon from carbon capture and utilization. Um, you know, there are estimates across the board from companies involved in the sector, uh, from scientists who have uh, studied this. I think as well, another uh, key thing that we haven't touched on here is that um, another type of, um, of carbon uh, dioxide resource price that we should consider is a, a direct air capture, of course, uh, for which there's a number of firms, you know, including one in, uh, in Canada, I believe, and, uh, and, and another in uh, Switzerland, who have announced uh, some fairly serious prototypes, uh, you know, demonstration uh, plants, uh, and, and seem to have a roadmap towards the development of commercial plants for uh, direct air capture. So um, these are the carbon uh, dioxide resource price uh, would be really vary depending on the technology. And uh, I'd, I'd be happy to provide more details uh, at a later stage, maybe offline. Um, so I hope that answers your question. I'm going to move on to Alexander uh, asking us whether we've considered the effects related to zero or even negative prices of electricity in the case of overproduction by uh, photovoltaic, uh, which is likely to be more and more relevant with further uh, PV development. So you know, what I'd like to say here is that um, we, what we uh, anticipate as being one of the key uh, solutions that solar fuels can bring to our energy systems is exactly this, is being able to take electricity off of the grid when, when, when we have overproduction. Um, you know, as, as far as, as contracts go between, uh, you know, electricity providers and, uh, you know, companies operating these solar fuel plants, you know, the way I would see it is that they might have um, arrangements that that deal with this uh, uh, precisely in that, and I and I don't I don't believe they will have uh, they will be experiencing zero or even negative prices. I think that uh, uh, this will be factored into to the prices paid, and and we'll we'll probably be seeing um, uh, you know more kind of ad hoc arrangements. Uh, but that, that that is indeed an excellent question, uh, and and indeed you know raises the point of what exactly are we trying to solve with solar fuels here is an ability to flexibly uh, bring in uh, capacity for hydrogen production to be able to then uh, store hydrogen as a means. And I think a lot of, um, a lot of groups are studying this, uh, store hydrogen as a means of uh, addressing the temporal imbalance uh, in, in renewable energy production, whether that's intraday, uh, you know, uh, the wind is blowing a little bit harder at the moment, but a little bit less later in the evening, or, or really uh, interseasonal where we see uh, you know, high variations and of course solar radiance and then, and then wind energy, average, you know, wind energy, uh, you know, throughout the year in, in a lot of jurisdictions. 
Um, so I, I hope, Alexander, that that gives you a little bit of an answer to your question. Um, I see that we did have a, a question for, um, from Thomas, uh, Thomas Schleck from uh, the European Commission in the chat. So uh, Thomas would like to know if we can make a prediction about what will be the technology mix or the coexistence of different technologies, including those building on each other, so hydrogen and e-fuels, based on the market outlook and cost structure uh, presented. Um, so Thomas is asking the question a little bit in line of Porter's competitiveness theory, uh, where we would have uh, 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 you know, some room for low cost uh, differentiation and then niche, niche strategies. Um, well, thank you, Thomas, for that, that very uh, interesting and challenging question. Um, I think it'd be difficult to make a prediction right now uh, about exactly what the mix might look like, but I think that what I want to say, I think the key message here is that indeed there are, uh, there's place for differentiation. I think there's a lot of room for um, a, a healthy mix of different technologies coming to market. Uh, as, I've, as I've illustrated, you know, uh, and, and I think especially as my, my colleague Corinne has pointed out, um, power to methane technologies, uh, for example, are expected to come to market uh, a little bit later, maybe to some, than some others, given the fact that, um, that, that uh, the cost of uh, natural gas is expected to remain relatively low, uh, you know, relative especially to other fossil fuels, for example. Um, but you know, that being said, uh, we still use, uh, for example, oil products today, uh, simply because this is how we uh, you know, run our vehicles or, 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 or you know, our, our, our planes, et cetera. So, um, there always is room, of course, for you know, a more expensive technology, and this is why we've tried to look at individual benchmarks within a sort of use case application and, uh, and not to really compare uh, you know, different uh, uh, solar fuel technologies that would have different applications across the board. Um, and so you know, some of what we've looked at in the market outlook, again, was uh, you know, looking at what might be uh, most applicable in, in industry. And, and, you know, I think we've talked a lot about hydrogen there, but of course, you know, one big assumption is, you know, when does power to methane become competitive? And as soon as power to methane becomes competitive, I mean, I think industry is a large consumer of natural gas and, uh, and, and, you know, gradually we'd hope that the, the natural gas would, uh, would be phased out in favor of, uh, of, you know, um, power to methane based, uh, sorry, um, of, of, of solar hydrogen based power to me uh, methane. Uh, so that's just one answer for buildings, but you know, of course, uh, in, in transport, we see um, we see the, the the a number of different technologies for e-liquids being uh, competitive and 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 having a bit of a healthy mix there. So um, I hope that answers your question, Thomas. Um, and uh, I believe that question is now gone. Um, so I'm not sure. I'm just going to go through some of the more open questions here and make sure that I've answered them all. It looks like I have. So just checking the time here, we're actually perfectly on schedule, but um, um, I think that, you know, we can just wait and see if anybody has one last question to ask. And, uh, and if there's anything else, um, I think that uh, we have some answers in the chat regarding the, um, right, beautiful. Uh, I think a little bit more precision on the, the carbon price I did, uh, I was a little bit maybe over ambitious for where Germany might be headed. Uh, this was not 90 euros per ton, but uh, we're talking about 65 euros per ton still. Uh, that's by 2026. If you look at that at a curve going from 25 to 65 in 2026, uh, you can easily anticipate relatively higher carbon prices in, um, in the future. And so this is, uh, this is where we expect uh, you know, real competitiveness for solar fuels to come from. I think you know a large part of the answer here is going to be carbon prices uh, and having true carbon pricing. I think uh, will be a, a key part of um, of enabling the competitiveness of, of solar fuels. So I, I believe that we don't have any more questions, and I think that this uh, concludes our session for today. I just want to thank everyone, uh, you know, attendees and, and panelists, uh, speakers, and uh, you know everyone who's worked on this project. Uh, for uh, coming together and, and, uh, and having a great discussion today. Um, I, uh, yeah, would like to, to, to thank you again uh, and, and especially thank you for the, the very positive and hopeful messages that have been uh, brought forward today. 
I hope that uh, you know we can all continue to collaborate on these important topics in the future. Um, and without further ado, I just want to wish you a, a very nice evening and uh, and hope to speak to all of you very soon.